Now a House hearing on premature birth and infant mortality. We'll hear from witnesses representing the Centers for Disease Control and the National Institutes of Health. Frank Pallone of New Jersey chairs the Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Health. This is two and a half hours. The meeting of the House Subcommittee is called to order, and today we are having a hearing on prematurity and infant mortality, what happens when babies are born too early. I'll recognize myself for an opening statement initially. The consequences of um, premature births and infant mortality, both the causes and consequences, need to be examined uh, because this is an important but complicated public health issue for which much is still unknown. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, each year more than a half million babies in the United States, or one in every eight, are born prematurely. This statistic is up 20 percent from 1990, and we're just starting to see a decline. Despite the recent decrease, preterm birth remains a pressing health issue which deserves ample attention as it is the greatest risk factor for infant mortality and contributes to a host of acute and chronic conditions. While much advanced research has been conducted and continues today, researchers are still trying to understand why preterm labor occurs. However, we do know that there are a set of factors that put women at higher risk of having, having a premature baby. Some known factors include carrying more than one baby, having a previous preterm birth, high blood pressure, and diabetes. In addition, we know that there are also external factors that occur either alone or in combination with other individual characteristics. And these include age, race, poverty, marital status, stress, environmental chemicals, and many others. I'm interested to hear from our witnesses today how these factors intertwine and what we can do moving forward to limit their effects. While not directly linked to prematurity, I'm particularly interested to hear today about the prevalence of stillbirths and sudden unexpected infant death, or SUID, within the infant mortality rate in the United States. Like preterm birth, stillbirth has some risk factors and causes such as maternal medical conditions, fetal factors, umbilical cord problems, and placental abnormalities. However, despite these known risk factors, there is no known cause for as many as, of half, as many as half of all stillbirths, leaving many parents without answers to the reasons for these deaths. No parent should have to endure the pain of losing a child, especially without knowing why that child was taken from them, taken from them so soon. And I've introduced a bill called the Stillbirth and SUID Prevention Education and Awareness Act, which would improve, improve data collection and education so we can better understand the cause of these deaths and help parents get the information and answers they want to prevent. The bill will also fund investigations to finally provide some answers by creating a national registry to help researchers understand the scope and impact of these tragedies. By understanding the causes of death, we can prevent these tragedies in the future, and we want every child to have the chance to grow up healthy. In my opinion, infant mortality is a public health problem that needs the attention of the subcommittee so I'd like to thank all of our witnesses for being here today. Uh, I know other members have raised this. This is not a um, legislative hearing on my bill, but a uh, oversight hearing, essentially, to find more about these issues and to determine whether or not we should uh, move forward with some legislation. So at this time, I'd, I guess we'll go to, um, to Mr. Whitfield. The gentleman from Kentucky is recognized. Well, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much, and I certainly want to thank the panel of witnesses for being here today on this very important subject. As the Chairman said, half a million babies are born preterm in the U.S. each year, and the Center for Disease Control states that preterm births are the greatest risk factor for infant mortality, with over one-third of all infant deaths being attributed to uh, preterm births. And according to the Institute of Medicine, there is, not, there is no one cause of preterm birth. Rather, there are socioeconomic, biological, and environmental factors that all can lead to prematurity. One area that I am particularly interested in, and I think it's very important that we explore, is the reporting methods used by different countries. Uh, I think it's important that we all have the same reporting standards so that we can really determine what the health statistics are as they relate to infant mortality. 
According to the CDC, in 2005, the latest year that the international ranking is available, the United States ranked 30th in the world in infant mortality behind most European countries. But uh, th there is not one consistent reporting uh, standard for many of these countries. And I do feel it is important that we establish a uniform standard. I look forward to our witnesses today and uh, the information that they will provide us. And I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Whitfield. Uh, next is our Vice Chair, Ms. Capps, the gentlewoman from California. Thank you, Chairman uh, Pallone, for holding this extremely important hearing. To our witnesses for being here today, and uh, many, and and to the the fact that we have this bill being discussed, uh, we have uh, quite a few health professionals in the audience, and we have a group uh, on on the Hill visiting of care an international organization with very strong ties to this legislation as well. Many people would just assume that the United States, being as advanced as it is, doesn't have significant infant mortality rates or that everyone has access to high quality prenatal care. It's kind of a given. Um, and that pre prevention of prematurity or other complications is, is not a, a, a serious situation. But the truth is, and that's why I'm so thankful that we're having this hearing today. The United States lags far behind other industrialized nations in infant mortality rates and, I might add, maternal mortality rates as well. So why is this happening in our country? First and foremost, we have a problem of access. Fortunately, we have now a new health reform law which puts into place several measures that will improve the health of our mothers and of our infants. This will happen through, eventually, universal coverage training of more health care providers, greater emphasis on prevention and wellness through grants and other incentives. But there's always more that we can and should be doing to ensure safe pregnancies and safe babies. For example, I was proud to join in the recent Capitol Hill launch of a new service called Text for Baby. And this is done with the Congressional Caucus for Women's Issues. Uh, and uh, and that, uh, Text for Baby is a new free mobile health information service designed to promote maternal and child health among underserved populations through simple text messaging. And I plan to, uh, to in my congressional district, to find a way to uh, allow some of my constituents to see this program demonstrated. And I hope that we'll see more programs like this to get funded through the new mandatory spending, which we will put in, which will are put in place now for prevention and wellness. The other important need is to better gather data and conduct further research so that we can develop a more coordinated and comprehensive strategy. I'm proud to co-sponsor two important pieces of legislation that do address infant health research and education. One is the per Birth Defects Prevention, Risk Reduction and Awareness Act, and this is sponsored by Rosa DeLauro. And then there's also your own bill, Mr. Chairman, uh, Stillbirth and SU, uh, 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 SID Prevention Education and Awareness Act, sponsored by uh, Chairman Frank Pallone. Having a healthy pregnancy and a healthy baby shouldn't be determined by the color of your skin, where you live, or how much money you earn. I'm eager to hear from our witnesses today to see what steps we can take to reduce infant mortality and morbidity for all families in the United States. I pledge my continued support to make pregnancy and childbirth safe and healthy for all moms and their newborns. And I yield back. Thank the gentlewoman. A gentleman from uh, <laughs> Pennsylvania, Mr. Pitts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As we will hear, prematurity is the number one risk factor in infant mortality, and preterm birth rate in the United States has been on the rise for the past few decades. Not only is the potential for mortality a risk for a preterm infant, but these babies could also face a wide range of health problems, some lifelong, such as breathing and respiratory problems, vision problems, increased susceptibility to infection, and intellectual disabilities, to name a few. While we do not know precisely why more babies are being born preterm, one thing we do know is that we need medical professionals to care for women and their babies throughout pregnancy. So that's and this brings us to the issue of medical liability. One of our witnesses on the second panel, Dr. Hal Lawrence, is here representing the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, or ACOG. ACOG's 2009 survey on professional liability sought to determine how medical liability legislation and medical liability insurance issues affect the practices of its members. 
Some of the survey's statistics and conclusions are astounding. This comes from the survey's executive summary. Quote, of the survey respondents who reported making changes to their obstetric practice because of insurance affordability or availability or both, 19.5% reported increasing the number of cesarean deliveries. Additionally, 21.4% decreased the number of high-risk obstetric patients, 10.4% decreased the number of total deliveries, and 6.5% stopped practicing obstetrics altogether." End quote. When survey respondents were asked about making changes to their obstetric practice as a result of the risk or fear of professional liability claims or litigation, here were the results. 30.2% decreased the number of high-risk obstetric patients. 29.1% reported increasing the number of cesarean deliveries. An additional 13.9% decreased the number of total deliveries. And 8% stopped practicing obstetrics altogether. Over my years in Congress, I've heard from multiple OBGYNs who, due to medical liability climate, could no longer afford to practice in Pennsylvania and were either retiring early, no longer delivering babies, or moving their practices to nearby Delaware. In just the city of Philadelphia and four surrounding counties in southeastern Pennsylvania, where I'm from, 18 hospitals have closed their maternity wards since 1997, and a 19th will end obstetric services next month. Since 2001, southeastern Pennsylvania has lost 30 percent of its practicing obstetricians. And according to the chief of obstetrics, obstetrics at Hahnemann Hospital, Dr. Owen Montgomery, Lloyds of London calls southeastern Pennsylvania the worst liability market in the world. Medical liability is a serious problem with direct consequences for patients, particularly for mothers and their unborn children. And in recently passed health care, our law, what did we do to ameliorate this situation? We funded state demonstration projects on medical, medical liability. We've already had two large and quite successful demonstration projects on this issue. Their names are California and Texas. We don't need more studies. What we need is real reform, and in this case, the new health care reform law does not deliver. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Um, next is the uh, gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding the hearing to today on infant mortality. According to the CDC, the United States ranks 28th among developed countries in infant mortality with 6.9 deaths per 1,000 live births. Among the leading causes of infant mortality in the United States, birth defects, preterm birth, low birth weight, sudden infant death syndrome, and respiratory dis distress syndrome, preterm birth and low birth weight are the only factors that haven't declined. According to the March of Dimes, who we will hear from today, insurance plans for large employers paid an average of $64,713 to cover the cost of inpatient and outpatient medical care and prescriptions for one preterm newborn and a mother. That figure doesn't include the cost of potential rehospitalization and long-term care and services. The Agency for Health Care and Research and Quality estimated in 2005 that on a national scale, private insurance and Medicaid each paid about $7.4 billion to cover preterm infants inpatient hospital charges. In Texas, Medicaid covers about half of all births annually. The Texas Health and Human Service Commission re reports Texas Medicaid spent $408 million in 2007 on hospital costs associated with preterm births. Texas and our district in particular still leads the nation in percentage of uninsured residents and Texas also has the third highest rate of births to teen mothers nationally at 63.1 per 1,000. From 1990 to 2006, CDC National Center for Health Stats, uh, statistics rather, uh, data showed the rate of preterm birth in Texas increased 22% from 11.2% of live births in 1990 to 13.7% in 2006. The state saw a slight decrease from 2006, a 1% decrease from 2006 to 2007. In Texas, 18.7% of live births to African-American women are preterm compared to 12.7% for, for Anglo women, 13.3% for Hispanic women, 11.3% for Asian women. 
One cause that has been pointed to as a potential cause of preterm births is induced or cesarean births at 34 to 36 weeks due to a miscalculation in the calculated and the gestational age of the baby. At the Tex Med Conference in 2009, the Texas Medical Association House of Delegates adopted a recommendation to support the prevention of preterm births caused by deliberate delaying delivering a baby early by physicians and who attend and others who attend at the delivery of infants. The recommendation presented by the TMA's Committee on Maternal and Pre Prenatal Health grew out of the March of Dimes concern that some pre premature births may occur without good medical justification such as a request or convenience of the mother or because of incorrect calculation of the gestational age of the fetus. I'm hoping the witnesses today will address this topic. Again, I want to thank all our witnesses for being here and appreciate uh, the time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Green. Our ranking member, Mr. Shimkus. Uh, first of all, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I'm going to ask unanimous consent that all opening statements may be submitted for the record. We've got competing hearings, and I'm not sure everyone's going to be able to make it up. Without objection, so ordered. I also want to apologize for not being here punctually. The uh, appropriation committee is uh, dealing with um, um, some testimony. Kristen Fitzgerald, who testified before our committee, whose husband. Well, I was told you were here before me. <laughs> I was, but then I left. <laughs> So that, that's my um, apology. Uh, and the last thing I want to, on the record, uh, we have, uh, we asked for a, um, uh, someone to testify on the second panel, a uh, Republican witness. Uh, they did not get their testimony in on time. I've been very hard on folks from the administration for not getting their testimony on time. So I asked the chairman to disinvite uh, the Republican member of the second panel, which we ended up doing, and, and I think that's appropriate. And I just want to take all the burden for it's it. It's going to make me, it make it harder for me. I'm going to have to make sure the administration witnesses are on time now. You've got to lead, lead by example. That's the key, Mr. Chairman. You can always go. You always go well. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Any time a child is born, it's special. Uh, although preemie births make it challenging, I've been able, just like many members, go through hospitals and see uh, great facilities that are doing all they can to save the lives of the. Uh, premature babies. We passed the, the Premie Act a couple years ago, I think uh, Freddie Upton's bill, and so hence the uh, analysis of data and the follow-up that's occurring here. We do have um, issues with making sure no one's going to dispute that we're not as good as we could be in this country. We want to make sure we just are comparing apples to apples versus apples to oranges, and, and I do this in other committees. Uh, uh, in, the, in the telecom. I hate it when we're compared to Liechtenstein on broadband access. So um, we just make sure that uh, when we want to compare apples to apples, we're doing other countries may not consider a, a live birth when we consider a live birth. And so let's, uh, let's throw that out there and, and just get uh, clear data. So if we're going to do some comparisons, we're going to do some comparisons. Um, the um, as always, I, I also want to make sure that, as ranking member, I continue to stay on record calling for additional hearings on the health care law. We just had a CBO report out this week. It says, oh, we made a mistake. If there's $110 billion in additional cost, that's all part of that calculation that uh, we were told that this was going to save money, and that's without the doc fix. So we know that those stats are not correct. Uh, we think it's time to start talking about this. Uh, and we think it's time, especially on this issue, the Medicaid issue for the poor, as we add 18 million more people to the Medicaid rolls without funding, who gets left out? And I think the very people we're talking about today, the poor mothers with no care, because what docs will do in Illinois, we're $12.5 billion in debt. Medicaid's paying 30 cents on a dollar 280 days late. 30 cents on a dollar, 280 days late. And, 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 the, and the doctors who are servicing Medicaid patients, some are just writing it off, and some are going to start limiting that access to care. And this is the, the issue that's also been raised by the administration and, and uh, Secretary Sebelius when she said, we need more docs. We need more primary care physicians. And guess what? This health care law does nothing to, do, to address more providers. So 
we will continue the clarion call to say, let's have some hearings on the law. I'm going to end with, uh, with this. Uh, a, a, a recent, uh, an individual who recently served in my staff left and, and, and went to Colorado and, and now uh, has been working in the private sector. Uh, she sent me an email and as a direct result of the passage of this health care law, uh, her insurance company folded. Her child who had a pre-existing condition now has no coverage. As a direct result of this law, she cannot purchase insurance for her family because of a child with a pre-existing condition. Now that, folks, that's something we can fix. We can have a hearing today. We can, pat, we can draft legislative language tomorrow, and we can move it to the floor next week. Why do we accept a gap in this period of time when we're allowing folks to not have coverage based on pre-existing conditions when we were promised that that would not be the case? So, Mr. Chairman, and I, hopefully you'll raise this issue to the full committee chairman. I know he's busy down in the O&I hearing. But we'll continue to say, I think it's time to start talking about the effects of this health care law. And I yield back my time. Thank you. The gentlewoman from Illinois, Ms. Schakowsky. Thank you. Um, first, at the request of our Energy and Com Commerce Committee colleague, Jay Inslee, I, want una I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a statement from Seattle Children's Hospital. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Pass can it down I, to can us I have then. my time back, though? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, the creation of the uh, oh, look, first let me say that uh, fortunately the health care bill that we passed does um, allow for children with pre-existing conditions um, requires that they be el eligible health for health care and not be excluded. The, uh, the creation of the Millennium Development Goals has placed significant attention on maternal and infant mortality rates within the in international community. The aim is to drastically reduce these rates by 2015, and we have made visible, albeit slow, pro uh, progress toward these goals. But as we work with our international partners to reduce infant and maternal deaths in some of the most challenging places in the world, I am constantly reminded that we face um, a health disparities crisis right here at, at home. In fact, one out of eight U.S. babies is uh, born prema prematurely. Uh, Gwen Moore, our colleague uh, and vice chair of the Congressional Caucus for Women's Issues, represents Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and she often talks about the absolutely abhorrent health disparities that are so evident, evident in the infant and maternal mortality rates in her district. 33 out of every 100,000 African American women died from pregnancy related complications in 2006, compared to fewer than 10 among, among white women during that same period. There are studies showing that even when researchers control for socioeconomic factors, health risks like smoking or chronic disease in geographic locations, a poor white woman is more likely to have a healthy, childbirth than a wealthy African-American woman. So most of our witnesses today have, refer, have referenced this disparity and have pointed to reasons why these statistics might bear out the way that they do. But what I'm left with when, when looking at the collective testimony is, is that it doesn't seem that we really know why there is such a discrepancy in the rates of premature births, birth defects, and infant mortality and maternal mortality across different populations. Is it an access to health care issue? Is it culture? Is it socioeconomic status or location or the number of children born to one mother? Why is it that African American women are one and a half times more likely to deliver a preterm infant compared to a, a white woman? I hope we will get some of those uh, answers um, today. And while I'm concerned about the uh, plateau that we seem to have hit in reducing infant mortality in this country in the 21st century, I do know that there's a lot of interest and a lot of collaboration aimed at bringing healthy pregnancies to healthy term. Uh, Congresswoman Capps mentioned uh, a, a very interesting and innovative program, Text for Baby, for, uh, which is a collaborative effort among the Department of Health and Human Services, White House Office on Science and Te Technology, and seven major corporations, public-private uh, partnership, uh, to work with at-risk expecting uh, uh, moms. So you go to um, 
text BABY, B-A-B-Y, or B-E-B-E -B -E at 511411, and at-risk young women can receive text messages reminding them to schedule a prenatal visit or get a flu shot or avoid drugs and alcohol, et cetera. One small step. I look forward to uh, hearing the, the testimony today, and I yield back, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentlewoman. The gentleman from uh, Pennsylvania, Mr. Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Years ago, before I uh, ran for the State Senate, I practiced as a psychologist at McGee Women's Hospital in Pittsburgh and followed up infants in the newborn intensive care unit. There was a moment when I was seeing one of the babies there, um, very premature, very small, transparent skin, hooked up to all sorts of equipment, probably not much bigger than my hand, and another baby born addicted to crack cocaine. And I remember saying to the nurse, I've had enough of this. I can't put up with this anymore. She says, well, are you going to run for office and change the system? I said, sure. So here I am. Uh, the system still has problems. And I want to point out how I hope the scope of this hearing actually expands so we can deal with these problems. Some years ago when we looked at murder rates in this country is declining, people looked upon that as a reason either to give their community a pat on the back or a kick in the rear because their murder rates were either going up and down. One factor that was not computed into that was the access to uh, paramedics and a critical care hospital, which was making a difference in life and death and, of course, reducing uh, rates of murder because some people didn't die. It is important that Congress at that time and this time does not misread statistics and we get accurate information on a number of things and that I suggest is not just mortality but long-term developmental outcome. It is extremely important. I hope this is something the witnesses can provide today with this. Uh, we're, we'll talk about a number of epidemiological issues, and I hope we don't just get caught up in which nation wins the contest of the lowest mortality rate, because for me that's not valid information at all. We need accurate information of what exactly happens. We need to know maternal factors, external factors. Is it income, education, family issues? Is it uh, other factors such as maternal smoking, weight gain or loss, nutrition, drug use, age, trauma, complications during pregnancy, race? Are there medical issues we need to know about, such as infection rates, prenatal care, access to level three nurseries, access to developmental intervention, levels of training of neonatologists, pediatricians, family physicians, uh, schools, other educational, educational institutions, and that statistical analysis to making sure that the definition of each one of these is the same between communities and between nations. The, I might add this, that over the years of the children that I have seen born premature or very premature it is interesting to me now as I go through and going back to visit communities uh, and inevitably some parent will come up to me and introduce their child to me who I took care of and who I saw when they were very, very young. In many cases, the child is successful, working, and they introduce me to their own children. In addition to that, not making me feel so young when I see that happening, it also makes me very proud that when you surround people with good quality medical care uh, and tertiary care, uh, good NICU care, that is a very important factor. I know the research that I did in persistent pulmonary intervention in the newborn, of all the factors we looked at, what was one of the most significant factors of relating also to seizure disorders and infarcts and developmental outcome had to do with where the child was cared for, how close they were to a level three nursery, and not just uh, the other medical care around. This is so extremely important. I want to make sure that any funding that Congress looks at or any change of policy directly addresses these issues. Uh, rather than just saying, let's throw money at this issue and make sure we have some there, let's make sure we're doing a, a, a critically good job. And, and I hope that the witnesses will provide this, uh, this Congress with this information. We want to do it right, uh, but it is a matter of just doing more than uh, look, comparing us to other nations. And with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Barrow. I thank the chair, but in the interest of the witness's time, I'll waive an opening. Okay, thank you. The gentleman reserves. Um, gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Gingrey. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you, and, and uh, thank you for calling this hearing. Obviously, as a, a physician member uh, of, the, of the House, I'm extremely interested in the subject, having uh, practiced uh, and delivered babies for 31 years. Uh, you know, what concerns me most uh, when I hear that uh, a CDC report uh, going back to 2005 that ranks the United States 30th in the world uh, in regard to infant mort mortality, which as we all know uh, is the death of a, of a child within the first uh, year of life. Uh, and you, you start scratching your head and, and, and say, well, how could that be? 
when we spend two and a half times uh, as much per capita on health care in this country. And uh, clearly, uh, with all corrections that, that need to be done in making those comparisons, we, our, our prematurity uh, rate and our infant mortality rate is too high, and we should uh, make every effort to do something about that. And I really look forward to both panelists, uh, panels of witnesses today to help us understand how we can do that. Uh, but when you compare our country to uh, countries that uh, uh, count uh, a, a uh, death uh, in the first 24 hours of life uh, as a miscarriage, essentially, uh, that's not a fair comparison. Forty percent of premature infants in our country, many of them immature, are born before 32 weeks, not just before 37 weeks. Uh, many of them are going to die in the first 24 hours of life, in fact, 40 percent. So when some countries don't even count those as live births, uh, and others say, well, you know, any, any uh, I think France does this, uh, any child that's less than 500 grams uh, is not considered a live birth. Or, or other countries that say any child that's less than 30 centimeters in length uh, is not considered a live birth. We have got to, as uh, other colleagues have mentioned, uh, compare apples to apples to get a true meaning and understanding. Uh, and I'm not going to say these statistics were necessarily used to, uh, to, to make a point that we need to, to have a universal health care system or single payer system or pass uh, uh, the, the uh, Senate Bill 3590. Uh, that we did here just a month ago. Uh, but let's use the right statistics. It's, it's very important that we do that. As, as we look at matters related to obstetric and pediatric care, I think we should not overlook the need to enact meaningful tort reform uh, to help address the shortage of OBGYN OB providers in markets all across the country. I believe that Republicans and Democrats together uh, can work on this issue, one in which I think m most uh, Americans support. And I want to make, Mr. Chairman, one, one last point. I realize my time is up, but uh, I want to welcome Dr. Lawrence from the American College of OBGYN, who is going to be on the second panel. Uh, Dr. Lawrence, as a practicing OBGYN for over 30 years, uh, I am interested in hearing more about your mom's initiative. Uh, it's my hope that efforts like yours might improve both maternal uh, and infant health in our country, and I'd like to find out ways that we can work together in this area. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, and with that, I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Gingry. Uh, next is the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, calling this hearing today. I, I recently uh, met with a constituent of mine, uh, Arnold Goodman of Avon, Connecticut, whose wife died during childbirth, and he explained to me the causes of maternal mortality, such as multiple cesarean sections, increased age, and obesity. There are also risk factors for pre premature birth. He told me that the gaps in research and the lack of uniform reporting that, premature, uh, that perpetuate both maternal mortality and premature birth and infant mortality still persist. And so I'm interested here today in learning more about with the fact that maternal mortality and premature, uh, prematurity rates are on the rise, the connections between the two and what we can do on both of those issues. Uh, and just as Mr. Shimkus is, I'm also interested in the issue of access to maternal and pediatric care for uh, expecting, expectant mothers. I have no doubt that the health care reform bill that extends coverage to millions of women uh, across this country are going to be able to link them up with the care that they have not had previous to, to today. But I also share Representative Shimkus's concern about the rates that are paid under the Medicaid program. And we just remind this committee that at one time, this Congress had in place a system by which the federal government oversaw uh, both rates for OB care and for pediatric care, called the Boren Amendment. That amendment was stripped out of the law in 1997. And in the House version of the bill, we put back in that federal oversight uh, over obstetric rates uh, and pediatric rates. And I would be happy to work on a bipartisan basis to try to put back into place some of the lost oversight that the federal government has had to make sure that states do the right thing uh, when it comes to obstetric and pediatric uh, rates. That issue of access to care um, uh, is made much, much better by the health care bill, but can be made even stronger uh, with strong federal oversight over Medicaid rates rates. Uh, I'm thrilled that the panel is here, very eager to hear your testimony, and again, thankful for the opportunity to listen. 
Thank you. The gentlewoman from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome to our witnesses. I want to thank you for the hearing. In my district, Memphis, Tennessee, has one of the highest prematurity and infant mortality rates in the entire nation. And it is a stat that uh, it impacts our neighborhoods, our state, and we know the impact it has here in our country. Too many mothers around the country just do not have, uh, those young mothers don't have the information that they need and the educational resources that they need to keep their babies healthy. And DHS has stated that children of mothers who receive no prenatal care are three times more likely to be born at a low birth weight and five times more likely to die than those who are born to moms that get that necessary prenatal care. And earlier this year, the Commercial Appeal, which is the Memphis newspaper, reported that premature birth and low birth weight are the biggest causes of those infant deaths in Memphis, Tennessee. So we are watching those numbers very closely. And since my days in the State Senate, this is an area where we have uh, watched this very closely. Indeed, Congressman Cohen and I had legislation last year uh, focused, had a resolution focused on our concern with this infant mortality rate. Uh, we have some great work that is being done in our state to address this. The Porter Leith Children's Hospital, March of Dimes, University of Memphis, Memphis City Schools all have programs. So we've got a partnership that we are doing in the public not-for-profit sector to help improve this rate. We've also got the UT Health Sciences Center that has a grant, a $1.7 million grant that they're working to expand, uh, expand the Blues Project, reduce the, uh, hoping to reduce those rates, and we're focusing that on our 10-care eligible moms. So welcome. We are pleased to have you with us today. Uh, we look forward to your testimony, and I and look forward to working with you on this issue, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Next is a gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Castor. I should mention that Ms. Castor has done quite a bit of work on this uh, prematurity and infant mortality bill and also was uh, asked that we, uh, you know, have a hearing on this subject. Well, thank you, Chairman Plone, uh, very much for today's hearing so we can address infant uh, prematurity and mortality and some of my specific concerns about the rising rates of elective preterm cesarean deliveries in the United States. And thank you for inviting uh, Dr. Charles, Charles Mayhem from uh, the University of South Florida, the founder of the Lawton and Rhea Child Center for Healthy Mo Mothers and Babies. Uh, I'm honored that he's here today and I'd also like to extend a special welcome to Dr. Fleischman, everyone at the March of Dimes and at from the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Um, the overriding message for pregnant mothers and families and health providers in the United States has got to be uh, taking babies fully to term to that 39 weeks, 40 weeks, unless there is an intervening medical reason. Uh, researchers at the National Center for Health Statistics just reported this week that the high rate of premature births is the primary reason that the U.S. has a higher infant mortality rate than other industrialized nations. Preterm births are linked to neurodevelopmental disorders and developmental delays. Let's face it, this is the key, brain development is the key to success for, for babies uh, when they become young and into their, in, even into their adult years. Many premature babies grow up healthy, but sadly many do not. Some need lifelong, constant care and have health problems throughout their lives. Although the National Center reported this week that preterm births have slightly declined in the U.S., uh, the rates are still way too high. And the rates of preterm and low birth weight babies in my home state of Florida are much higher and of great concern. Even with all the great advances in science, technology, medicine, too many babies are born prematurely, and there are disturbing racial disparities we must address. Nationally, the preterm birth rate is 12.3 percent. In my home state of Florida, it's nearly 14 percent. The March of Dimes gave Florida an F grade on its 2009 premature birth report card, so I'm committed to working with you to bring that grade up. Uh, and the cesarean rate has risen across the country to 32 percent 
of all births as of 2008. And one factor may be in preterm births, it may be this rising rate of elective C-sections. In Florida, the C-section rate is even higher, accounting for roughly 38 percent of all childbirths. And they, th and they think that in Dade County, Miami, we're approaching 50 percent now, where the World Health Organization has said uh, it really should be half of that. Elective C-sections prior to 39 weeks uh, really put babies to risk, so we need to understand these troubling numbers. Uh, the data displaying the rise in C-sections is clear, and speculation about the potential overuse of these surgeries is strong. The New York Times has featured several articles over the past six to seven months reporting that late preterm births are the fastest growing subgroup of premature births. Uh, cesareans have become the most popu common uh, pop surgery in American hospitals. And ACOG has recognized that the surgery is overused, and the March of Dimes reports that C-sections accounted for 92 percent of all preterm births in the U.S. from 96 to 2004. So let's, I'd really like to hear from our witnesses about this. I think we need more data and research. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to your testimony and the input of my colleagues moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. The gentlewoman from the Virgin Islands, Ms. Christensen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, in the interest of time, I'm going to um, submit my statement for the record. Okay. And um, Mr. Braley, gentleman from Iowa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing on premature and infant mortality. It's important that we examine the many risk factors and variables that relate to these tragedies. In Iowa, five mothers who each lost a daughter to stillbirth or infant death got together in 2003 and founded Healthy Birthday, a nonprofit organization dedicated to preventing stillbirths and infant deaths through education, advocacy, and parent support. This group of friends, including State Representative Janet Peterson, launched the Count the Kicks campaign in June of 2009, which is a public health and awareness effort to improve pregnancy outcomes. This campaign is supported by the March of Dimes Iowa chapter and seeks to reduce the number of preventable stillbirths by teaching expectant parents how to self-monitor their baby's movements and about the importance of tracking daily movements during the third trimester of pregnancy. Less than a year after the campaign's launch, 55% of OBGYN clinics in Iowa and 56% of the birthing hospitals have begun using the program. Research has shown that this type of education and awareness is very effective. A 2009 study conducted in Norway reported an overall decrease in stillbirth rate by one-third when patients were ed educated on monitoring fetal movements. If the U.S. achieved the same level of success, we could save more than 8,000 babies every year. With one out of every 150 pregnancies ending in stillbirth in the United States, it's hard to understand why this issue hasn't gotten more attention, but I believe that expanded awareness and education should be an integral part of efforts to reduce stillbirths. I commend Chairman Pallone for introducing the Stillbirth and SUID Prevention Education and Awareness Act. This bill will improve the health of children, enhance public health activities related to stillbirth, and reduce the occurrence of infant death. I'm proud to be a co-sponsor of this bill, and I encourage other members of the committee to support the bill, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, and I think that concludes our opening statements by the members of the subcommittee, so we'll now turn to our witnesses. I want to welcome you. Let me introduce our first panel. On my left is Dr. William Callahan, who is the senior scientist for Maternal and Infant Health Branch. Division of Reproductive Health, the National Centers for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And then we have Dr. Catherine Spong, who is the Branch Chief for the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development of the National Institutes of Health. Um, the drill is five-minute opening statements, and they become part of the record, and then we may, um, well, you actually, on your own discretion, if you like, can submit additional statements in writing afterwards. But if you would start, Dr. Callahan, appreciate your being here. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Shimkus, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this hearing on preterm birth and infant mortality. I'm Dr. William Callahan, Acting Chief of the Maternal and Infant Health Branch 
in the Division of Reproductive Health to Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I am also board certified in obstetrics and gynecology. Prior to making the transition to public health in 2001, I spent 14 years in private practice caring for thousands of women during their pregnancies. Today, I will briefly outline the burden of disease in the United States due to preterm birth and summarize our current and continuing surveillance and research activities. Preterm birth is defined as being born at less than 37 weeks, that is, at least three weeks before the predicted uh, due date for the pregnancy. Today, more than a half a million babies are born preterm each year in the United States. Although a CDC report released yesterday shows a very welcome and small decline in the preterm birth rate for 2007 and 2008 down to 12.3 percent, levels still remain higher than at any point in the 1980s and 1990s. Most of the increase in, uh, prior to this recent decline was among late preterm births, and those are births from 34 to 36 weeks of gestation. Preterm birth is an important risk for infant mortality. More than one-third of infant deaths can be directly attributed to preterm birth. Preterm birth and infant mortality are particularly critical issues in the African-American community. African-American women are one and a half times more likely to deliver a preterm infant compared to white women, and the infant mortality rate for black infants is more than twice that of white infants. We also need to think beyond infant mortality when we discuss prematurity. Preterm birth is a leading cause of disability in children. Moreover, in 2005, it was estimated the costs associated with preterm birth were $26.2 billion. At CDC, our work addresses preterm delivery through three basic mechanisms, surveillance, research, and building public health capacity. Surveillance is the core of CDC's work. We monitor how many infants are born prematurely, analyze trends, and define risk factors. There are several important surveillance systems that we use. The first is through collection of birth certificates and death certificates by the National Center for Health Statistics. The national statistics for prematurity rates are compiled from information on birth certificates. When birth certificate information is linked inf to information on death certificates, we're able to look at the causes of death for those babies who died during their first year of life. CDC's second large surveillance system on maternal and infant health is called PRAMS, the Pregnancy Risk Assessment Monitoring System. PRAMS is an ongoing state-specific surveillance system designed to identify and monitor maternal behaviors and experiences before, during, and after pregnancy among women who had live births. PRAMS has served to expand the information capacity of 37 states in New York City, and this unique surveillance system is now representative of approximately 75 percent of all births in the United States. CDC also provides resources to assist states in conducting surveillance of major birth defects, which are important causes of infant mortality. In terms of research, we are working with partners to try to understand some of the biology among women who delivered preterm. These studies focus on the interactions among genes, other biologic markers, race and ethnicity, and social and economic exposures for women. We really don't know a lot about why late preterm births increased and drove the overall preterm birth rate during the last several decades. We are currently involved in a study to review hospital medical records in order to discover why and how late preterm births occur. In the area of capacity building, CDC has 23 federal staff assigned to state health departments providing technical support for epidemiological research, public health surveillance, and state-based programs. As we move forward, we will be investigating how the quality of surveillance information can be improved and how we can use it to inform programs and public health practice. A society measures what it values, and we will strive to improve the core public health function of surveillance. As new ideas emerge about the reasons for and predictors of preterm birth and about possible prevention interventions, we will continue to synthesize evidence and attempt to fill in knowledge gaps through research. We will continue to press forward with our work in the area of understanding late preterm birth as this group continues to comprise the largest proportion of preterm births. As we learn more about causes and prevention, we anticipate the result will be more healthy babies and healthy families. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today, and I would be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Dr. Callahan. Dr. Spong? On behalf of the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development at the National Institutes of Health, 
I appreciate the opportunity to provide the committee with information about our research programs on preterm birth and infant mortality. I am Dr. Katherine Spong, Chief of the Pregnancy and Perinatology Branch at the NICHD. The NICHD mission is to ensure that every person is born healthy and wanted, that women suffer no adverse harmful effects from reproductive processes, and that all children have the chance to achieve their full potential for healthy and productive lives, free from disease or disability. As such, research on prematurity and its health outcomes falls squarely within the Institute's mission. As we've heard from your opening statements, and as Dr. Callahan elegantly stated, preterm birth is a major public health problem. In 2001, preterm birth became the leading cause of death among newborns. In those who survive, preterm birth accounts for one in five children with mental retardation, one of three children with vision impairment, and almost half of all children with cerebral palsy. Late preterm infants appear to be at higher risk for sudden infant death syndrome and have higher rates of neurologic and developmental morbidities during childhood. In adulthood, children born at low birth weight have an increased risk for cardiovascular disease, such as heart attacks, strokes, and hypertension, and an increased risk for diabetes. The NIH is committed to understanding the causes and to reducing the incidence of preterm birth, low birth weight, and infant mortality and their consequences. The NICHD was the lead federal agency in planning and coordinating the Surgeon General's Conference on Prematurity Prevention held in June of 2008. As I will describe, NICHD preterm research efforts address these recommendations and range from basic work on the mechanisms of labor, genetics, and proteomics to research regarding specific questions encountered in clinical practice and the long-term implications on the infant, mother, and family. While the NICHD supports the bulk of NIH research in this area, other institutes and centers also contribute to the overall NIH funding for infant mortality, low birth weight, and prematurity research projects. This totaled $278 million in FY 2009, including ERA funds, the last year for which we have complete data. One of the most successful approaches for research related to prematurity are the NICHD research networks, which allow physician scientists across the country to coordinate their work and share data. The Maternal Fetal Medicine Unit's network, composed of 14 sites across the country, conducts clinical studies to improve maternal fetal and neonatal health. This network has a remarkable track record of conducting high-priority clinical trials with its findings incorporated into practice. The Neonatal Research Network focuses on babies in the neonatal intensive care units to improve their health and outcome. The NICHD recently is funding a study on women in their first pregnancy, the Nulliparous Pregnancy Outcome Study. The best predictor of preterm birth, pregnancy outcome, is not available for these women, yet they account for 40% of all deliveries each year. The aim of this large multicenter study is to identify markers early in pregnancy that will identify women at the highest risk for preterm birth, preeclampsia, and stillbirth, with the goal to ultimately develop interventions and therapies. To understand the biologic mechanisms underlying spontaneous preterm births, the NICHD is supporting a wide range of research, including intrauterine infection, bleeding, and psychosocial stress. Another major emphasis is on preeclampsia, as it is the primary reason for medically indicated preterm births. Researchers supported by NICHD have shown that this disease is associated with an abnormal development of the placenta. A scientific workshop in NICHD-supported research identified and highlighted the significant complications associated with late preterm births, those babies born between 34 and 37 weeks, that account for 70 percent of all preterm births. These supported practice guidelines and affected changes in practice. One aspect of research is to identify markers or predictors of preterm birth. A short cervical length is a predictive marker and was identified through NICHD research. In a blinded multicenter observational study of women with a prior preterm birth, shortened cervical length in the mid-pregnancy can predict early spontaneous preterm birth. This has led to screening for cervical length in women who are at risk for preterm delivery. Ideally, the best outcome would be to prevent preterm birth in the first place. A major advance in prevention was made by the NICHD's Maternal Fetal Medicine Network studying women who'd had a previous preterm delivery and therefore were at risk for a recurrent preterm birth. This trial compared progesterone to placebo, and progesterone treatment lowered the risk of preterm birth by one-third, the first successful preventative therapy to reduce the risk of recurrent preterm birth and improve neonatal outcomes. The impact of this treatment was evaluated in a 2005 study, which estimated that 10,000 preterm births could be prevented annually if all eligible pregnant women received progesterone. The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists has recommended the use of progesterone to prevent preterm birth for women with a prior spontaneous preterm birth. In addition to studying preventative therapies, the MFMU network studies interventions during pregnancy to prevent complications in preterm infants. 
Recently, the network identified a therapy, magnesium sulfate, or Epsom salts, which, when administered to women who are at risk of delivering preterm, reduces the risk of cerebral palsy in surviving preterm infants by 45%. The NICHD also supports research on how to manage and care for preterm infants. One example is nitric oxide, a compound that is used to treat infants with severe breathing problems, but the safety and the efficacy for premature infants has had mixed results. To better understand the potential risks and benefits of inhaled nitric oxide therapy, the NIH will convene a consensus development conference in October of this year to assess the available scientific evidence and form conclusions about its clinical use in preterm infants. Both preterm infants and infant mortality have dramatic health disparities, with higher overall rates in African American women. NICHD-supported researchers are attempting to identify the factors to explain these disparities, and in August of this year, the NICHD will hold a scientific workshop focused on disparities in infant mortality, stillbirth, and preterm birth. Given the implications of preterm birth on long-term health and disease of the child and family, and affecting over half a million pregnancies each year, preterm birth truly is a public health priority. Were we able to prevent preterm births, not only would infant mortality improve, we would actually improve the health of the nation with less heart disease and diabetes in the children and healthier mothers and families. This is our goal. Again, thanks to the committee for your time and interest, and I'm pleased to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Dr. Spong. What we do now is we have questions from the panel uh, for five minutes or sometimes eight if they didn't do an opening, and I'm going to begin with myself. Uh, yes, initially, Dr. Callahan, in your testimony, you discussed CDC's role in surveillance in terms of monitoring infants born prematurely, analyzing trends, defining risk factors, and targeting prevention programs. I mentioned that I sponsored H.R. 3212, the Stillbirth and SUID Prevention Education Awareness Act, and I'm particularly interested in the collection of critical data to determine the causes of stillbirth and uh, sudden uh, unexpected infant death. Can you tell me what the CDC is doing to understand the causes and risk factors associated with stillbirths, a sudden unexpected infant death, and sudden unexplained death in childhood, and are there ways to reduce those risks? And then secondly, how would better data collection help reduce and prevent these deaths in the future, if you could? Uh, the National Center for Health Statistics collects uh, information on fetal deaths from fetal death certificates. Fetal death certificates are not birth certificates. They're their own. A, fe a fetal death report is what it's called. Um, so they are able to, th those are collected by states sent to NCHS. NCHS compiles those for the nation. The quality of information on fetal death certificates is not always what we would hope it would be. These are filled out essentially um, in real time at the bedside in the hospital and sent in. And there's a, a, a large, uh, a fair amount of variability in how stringently people fill those out. There's also a fair amount of variability in how much each fetal death is investigated at the individual level. Uh, a, to do this correctly, there needs to be fetal autopsy, there needs to be uh, fetal genetic studies, these aren't always done uh, consistently, and so the amount of information that is ultimately reported as to the cause of death can be variable, which leads us to your statement that in many cases we're left without a real good reason about why that happened. So efforts to improve the quality of fetal death reporting at the very individual, at each individual level at the time of each individual fetal death. Um, would be important in terms of improving um, uh, our information. There's also um, some pilot work that's being done uh, at CDC in Atlanta in the National Center for Birth Defects and Developmental Disabilities. There is a Atlanta Metropolitan Birth Defects uh, surveillance system and there's some pilot work being tagged on to that to try to um, see if fetal death registration can also be um, used with that same infrastructure. If that, if that was successful, that could be expanded to other birth defect surveillance systems. Uh, birth defect surveillance systems collect much more nuanced information almost through survey. Lastly, about sudden unexplained infant death, unexplained infant death uh, we have done a lot of work in this area, and we've learned that 
there is a difference between the sudden unexplained infant death and sudden infant death syndrome. Sudden infant death syndrome means there is no other plausible, there's no plausible explanation for the cause of death. It is truly unexplained. The more and more that people do uh, death scene investigations um, on the ground, again, at the in and around the time of the, uh, the infant death, the more and more people are finding that there actually may be explanations. Good thing about having an explanation, it doesn't bring a lot of relief to the grief of that parent, but if you have an explanation, now you, we have a chance of prevention. So uh, we're, we are in the process of establishing pilot registries for that. Well, thank you. I'm going to try to summarize this next one for Dr. Spong. Um, I think it's critically important that we do everything we can to ensure that we have the right research infrastructure. Uh, and so I wanted to issue three questions about the research network. First, how many women are usually in the clinical trials conducted by the, um, the network? I guess we're talking about the Maternal Fetal Medicines Unit Network. And is there a diverse population of women represented in the trials? Can you elaborate on the use of 17P to prevent prematurity? And would you discuss other interventions that have impacted patient care to date? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The first question was the number of patients um, enrolled in clinical trials. How in many the women are usually in them? Yeah. And is there a diverse population of women? So the number of patients enrolled in a given trial depends on what the trial is looking at and what the question is to be addressed, how big the effect needs to be, how rare the outcome is. Um, we have had trials that have included um, few number of patients, for example, 200, 300, and we've recently com completed a trial that included um, over 10,000 women. In addition, some of the observational studies have included, um, you know, many, many more women than that. Um, the diversity of the population is assured when the network is openly and actively recompeted every five years. Is as part of that recompetition, as part of looking at who should be a part of the network, includes geographic diversity and diversity in the patient population. Your question about 17 alpha hydroxyprogesterone cap rate or progesterone for the use um, to prevent preterm birth. This was a uh, landmark study as the first uh, preventative therapy identified for women who'd had a prior preterm birth. As a clinician, I knew that one of the very common things that you would see with a patient who'd come in for prenatal care who had had a prior preterm birth, we would say that you were at very high risk for another preterm birth, but we had nothing to offer her. Now with the use of 17-alpha-hydroxyprogesterone caparate, we have something that we can offer her that can reduce her risk of a, another preterm birth by about one-third. That, that um, progesterone is now being studied in other high-risk populations, so women who've had a prior preterm birth are at high risk, women who have multiple gestations are at high risk, and they have been studied, both women with twins and triplets, and it was found that progesterone did not reduce the rates of preterm birth in that population, and I think that's very important to know that it's not a, a cure-all for all prematurity, it is for specific conditions, and it is currently being evaluated in the setting of a shortened cervix that in an asymptomatic woman. Um, there are a number of other studies that the network has undertaken that have impacted um, practice. One example is the use of antenatal corticosteroids, which are given to women who are at risk of delivering preterm with the understanding that it will improve outcome for the babies. It decreases their complications, such as breathing complications and, and bleeding complications. Um, the network undertook a study looking at repeated doses of those steroids and found that, in fact, that was not beneficial. So it was a change in practice from repeating multiple doses of steroids. Another example is that one of magnesium sulfate being administered to women who are at risk for preterm birth, where it significantly reduced the risk of cerebral palsy by about 45 percent. Um, one of the unique factors from this network is that when these trials are published, they their findings are then often incorporated into professional guidelines, such as those by the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, making recommendations for how that should change and how that should be implemented into practice. I can give a number of other examples as well, but if No, I think we better stop over. there because I made you go over. It's not your fault. <laughs> Mr. Shimkus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, he, um, I want to throw this out there. There's either in the healthcare law, either I'm right that my constituent is denied the, per the ability to purchase insurance on the sole reason of a pre-existing condition of their child, or I'm wrong. And 
I would ask someone on the majority side to help me have a hearing on this issue to see who's right. Uh, uh, not a question. I'm asking for a hearing. I, you know, I have a case of a uh, former staffer who cannot get insurance because of the pre-existing condition of their child. Uh, my colleague from Illinois said that's not true, and I, I think this would be a good hearing to have on this issue of whether people right now under this health care law is being denied access because of pre-existing condition. So I mean, I, I'm going to put that on the record. My colleague's not here from Illinois who, who, who rejected my claim, um, but I throw that out as, as an issue. Um, I have, um, appreciate your, your testimony and you say words I can't even pronounce. But I, I do have a question on uh, Dr. Spong. Um, the mission of the NICHD is to ensure that every person is born healthy and wanted. Um, and I'm, I'm curious of, of why you have the word wanted there. And, and what does that mean? And what does that mean for what you do? It's, it's a curious word. Uh, and can you explain that? Uh, thank you for your question. The, the question is why um, the NICHD mission includes the word wanted. And um, I will be the first to admit that the mission was created um, before I started at working at the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. So I do not have that information for you at this time. But I'd be happy to get back to you in written testimony. Uh, well, yeah, I, I, it's, um, it's, an, it's an interesting word. I mean, I, I don't know what it means. Um, so if you could get I'd back be to me. To get I, back before to we you. make conjectures and think things, I'll just wait for a response because it's, a, it's just, I just don't know what that, what that means. Um, let me follow up with this question. If individuals change their lifestyle, stop smoking and manage their weight, would that reduce the risk of prematurity? Dr. Spong. The, there are, the risk factors that you stated were um, if they lost weight and if they stopped smoking, would that reduce um, preterm birth? Obesity, it's, uh, healthy lifestyles are good for pregnancy. Right. Obesity itself has a mixed message on whether or not it actually causes preterm birth. There are studies that would suggest that obesity is not, in fact, associated with preterm birth. That said, starting out with a healthy weight is optimal for pregnancy for a number of reasons, regardless of preterm birth. So we would certainly encourage all women to start pregnancy at a healthy weight. Smoking itself is associated with low birth weight or smaller babies um, and clearly is one major lifestyle change that people can make that can improve the health of their children and um, remove the risk of low birth weight. And let me follow up, because Dr. Callan mentioned that infection itself may not be the cause of prematurity, but rather the inflammation associated with the infection. Do you agree with that? My, the, the question regards to the role of infection versus inflammation on preterm birth. And preterm birth is a very complex condition. And I believe there are multiple pathways that can lead to a preterm birth. One is going to be an infectious pathway. Clearly, that can cause preterm birth. But the inflammation itself, in the absence of infection, can also cause preterm birth. And then are there contributing factors to increased inflammation that could be avoided through a change in lifestyle? That is an excellent question. The, those are areas that are currently getting teased out. Um, it is likely that it is not a single factor that causes much of preterm birth, but a constellation of events. So whether you have um, certain environmental factors, certain genetics, certain inflammatory markers, and then certain lifestyle events that can ultimately result in a preterm birth. And I, I want to thank you. I'm going to end. Uh, we have, uh, of course, on our side, we have Dr. Gingri and, and Dr. Burgess, who are also all both obstetricians, and I'm waiting for their uh, follow-up and questionings as they're experts in the field. And um, and I yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Capps um, asked that we enter into the record the, um, this letter from um, Secretary of Health and Human Services to the Speaker and I guess to the Republican leadership. Um, and it basically goes into um, the different um, provisions in the health care reform on 
adult and child coverage, pre-existing conditions, early retiree reinsurance, rescissions, uh, Medicare Part D. So, with the timelines. Uh, that's correct. The point, the point, the Secretary Sebelius has said, please, insurance companies, do con continue to cover people, kids with pre-existing conditions. The issue is they're not. And so I, I would suggest that we have a hearing on this. And uh, I mean, I, I don't, I mean, I'm just reading it. it uh, I'm, I'm just. You know what it is. I mean, you know, it I, yeah, says I'm, that I'm just effective beginning the, the date, September 23rd, September 23rd is there. And on March. So right now, people, if they have no insurance, they cannot get covered with pre existing conditions. That's the Except law. That some insurance companies are offering to do it. So you're not disputing the to. fact that my former staff or this family cannot get health insurance right now. It isn't required yet. It's not required. But it will be Thank very you. soon. But on March 29th, it's, it's required for children, though. No, but it's not right now. September 23rd. But it's not right now. It That's says on March 29th. So my point is we could pass a law tomorrow to do this. Well, Mr. Shim, because I'm just, look, I, I'm, I'm, first of all, does anybody have an objection to entering this into the record? Uh, I'd like to just look at it. Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, the only thing it says on pre-existing conditions, it says effective for policies or plan years just beginning on or after September 23rd, you prohibit from excluding coverage of yeah, children. It's a general, if, no, if Chairman would yield, my point is I'm going to continue to raise issues that we ought to have hearings on this law. And, um, and this is just another example of people not having access to health insurance because of pre-existing conditions. And this is something we could fix. I don't think there's any question that the law is the September date. But yeah. you can look at it and then but, reserve. Yeah. And we could bring a bill to the floor tomorrow and, and fix this. That's my point. And Mr. Chairman, if I could just stand in agreement with, with my colleague from Illinois, um, we handed an enormous task to the Department of Health and Human Services to create something out of whole cloth in this law that we passed hurriedly a couple of months ago. And really, it's incumbent upon this committee to maintain the vigilance and oversight over HHS and CMS as they come up with these rules and regulations that are literally going to affect every American, not between today and Election Day, but for the next three generations. So I hope you'll consider Mr. Shimkus's request to hold the appropriate hearings at, at this level. And the answer is yes, right? <laughs> what I would like, I, let, let me just have that back. We don't have a problem. If you don't have a problem, we're going to. All right, without objection, it's entered into the record. You do if you object, it's fine. You object? You said no? Okay. The gentleman, the gentlewoman from uh, California has the time. Mr. Chairman, you may not wish to call on me after all of that, but thank you. This has been a good discussion. Uh, and to back to the topic, but before I ask my question for Dr. Callahan, I want to just acknowledge that there are many members of a wonderful non-governmental organization called CARE uh, in, uh, on Capitol Hill today because they are very interested not only in this uh, hearing but in other topics having to do with, uh, uh, with uh, preterm uh, uh, delivery and birth. And I don't, one of them is a constituent of mine, so I want to wel welcome a particular group that was here. We had, uh, we had nurses earlier as well. Uh, Dr. Cal and I appreciate the testimony that both of you have given us. Dr. Callahan, in your testimony, uh, inclu you included some of the surveillance mechanisms that the CDC uses to monitor the pregnancy outcomes and also infant health. Especially with issues such as the ones we are discussing today, I believe it is critical to have really accurate and robust surveillance and data collection strategies. Now, you mentioned that only 37 states and New York City participate in what's called the PRAMS program and that the survey is representative of 75 percent of all births. Um, it's too bad we can't have closer to 100 percent. What are some of the barriers to implementation of, of this uh, participation in all states and for full representation so that we really have a, a much ro more robust data collection? Um, the, the one thing I will say, and this is very pertinent to your state, is California has a very complementary system that does not participate in PRAMS. And I believe the acronym, oh. um, I could get the precise name of, I think it's called MIWA. So we, uh, we do something different, but you can't use it in the national data collection. We, no, we cannot use that in the national da data collection. That's parochial to California. It's a very good system. 
The California right. system is good, but it doesn't help nationally. It doesn't help nationally. I see. So I, that's one of the barriers then, isn't it? It is a barrier because there are, are And so maybe some kind of smart that, scientist can figure our tech, uh, money, uh, a, a number cruncher can figure out how to uh, coordinate it so that it will be useful to California, but also to the United States. Because then one of the other problems that's l left with some of the other smaller states is their births are so small, and this is based on not a sampling of total births, but on a, on a sample of, of births, and so some very small states becomes very difficult to uh, get a, a sample that is representative. And of you all. really want to have a, a large state like California and all of New York, not just New York City in, right. involved. Okay. That's useful. Uh, thank you very much. It gives me something to think about with my, uh, st my own state. I'm very excited. Here's another question. I'm very excited to hear of the move to modernize vital record systems. Uh, maybe this is one arena where we need to do this, but there seems to be more room for data collection. Can you tell us more about what is currently be collect being collected on electronic birth records in light of the many factors? Of so maybe we're not even asking enough questions when we do data collection. In light of the many factors associated with premature birth and infant mortality and morbidity, what other data would be helpful to collect, especially with the kind of technology we have uh, to, to uh, collect and sort data? You're asking what other information could we yeah. collect on birth certificates? Do you, do you, are we lacking some in, We collect a lot of information on birth certificates. We collect a lot of information about maternal conditions during pregnancy. We collect uh, information about problems that occur during labor and delivery. But one of the things that we've seen over and over and over again when, when we um, go back and do validation of that information and is that it doesn't particularly, it doesn't do very well most of the time. Oh, so is, words, there, there is room for improvement. There's room for improvement at the level of data collection and data collection occurs individually at the individual hospital level. So there might be some legislation that would be useful to you to help um, uh, with the CDC uh, to do a, a, a better, to be more equipped to be able to, to do a better data collection. I've always said that if there's anything that I could do in my career in public health, it's to improve vital statistics because we have an infrastructure in place to M do it. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to suggest, or I'll just suggest it to my fellow committee members, that this is an area that would seem to be uh, the low-hanging fruit, <laughs> if you will, uh, for some of the uh, uh, challenges that we face in this area, that if we, that if we can put some bright heads together to figure out a better way to collect data and use it in, in a proper way that this would be very useful. I'm going to try one more question because I have 17 seconds and Dr. Spong, uh, Spong I appreciated your testimony as well. Um, you, you know, there's so many factors associated with preterm birth, the stealth, health status of the mother, you know, issues like diabetes, uh, uh, obesity, uh, deficiencies of certain nu nutrients and so forth, high blood pressure. Can you just say in a couple seconds more about the importance of preconception health? I mean, this is such a huge issue that starts really uh, a pre-birth with the, with the one-day mother, doesn't it? Yes, preconception care um, is clearly important. Women who start pregnancy healthy tend to have healthier pregnancies. That said, I cannot point to research or data that as to what exactly needs to go into that preconception care that will actually ultimately result in improved outcome. But we do know that women who have a healthy lifestyle, who are of um, an appropriate weight, who don't have habits such as smoking um, or alcohol exposure, um, and tend to have healthier pregnancies. Thank you. Um, the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Pitt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, I would like to ask unanimous consent to uh, enter uh, into the record uh, a couple of articles and uh, a list of studies uh, that have found that women with prior induced abortions are at increased risk for premature birth and low birth rate. I'm going to take a look at them, but I don't see a problem. Just let me look a second. It, it, uh, the articles are by the American Association. Sure. Uh, Without objection, so ordered. Plans. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Callahan, you mentioned that the CDC has worked with states to assist with smoking cessation programs during pregnancy. Have any states used their master settlement agreement funds to implement smoking cessation programs targeted at pregnant women? I really don't have the information at hand to, to um, uh, answer that question. I'd be happy to do that and get that information to you. All right. Um, 
you mentioned that um, African American women are more than, I think you said twice more likely than white women to have preterm birth. Um, About one, one and, and a half, half times, times more likely to have preterm birth, twice as likely to have very preterm infant. Why is that the case? That's w one of the holy grails. Uh, understanding that is probably one of the holy grails in all of perinatal health and perinatal medicine. These are disparities that we have seen over and over and over again. They are pernicious when we adjust for almost anything that we can think of. If we adjust for socioeconomic status, we adjust for education levels, it doesn't go away. In fact, as was mentioned previously in this hearing, the gap is even, these gaps are even greater when we look at the difference between the most well-off African-American women and the most well-off white women, the gap is even greater. Uh, as Dr. Spong mentioned, the paths to preterm birth are likely very, very complex. This has been likened to this other group of diseases that we call common complex diseases, like cardiovascular disease, where at the end of the day there's a preterm birth, but there are lots of different ways to get there. We are cons our current kind of working hypotheses around these that there are genetic factors, there are environmental exposures, environmental in the most holistic ways, such as stress, um, uh, poverty, all of which are interacting um, to result in whatever happens that, uh, that goes into uh, spontaneous preterm birth. If we knew the answer to that question, and if we could fix that problem, our preterm birth rate and our infant mortality rate would be dramatically decreased in the United States. In, in 2006, uh, Congress passed the PREMI Act, authored by uh, Mr. Upton in the House, and one provision of the legislation called on HHS to award grants to public no and private nonprofit entities to conduct demonstration projects for the purpose of improving the provision of information on prematurity to health professionals and the public and improving the treatment and outcomes for babies born preterm. And the grants were to support programs to test and evaluate screening for and treating of infections, counseling on optimal weight and good nutrition, smoking cessation education, counseling, stress management, pro appropriate prenatal care. How many grants have been awarded under this program and what have been the results of these demonstration projects so far? We uh, began receiving appropriations for, for the PREMI Act in 2009. And we have conti continued to do work in preterm birth, as I outlined, with regard to looking at late preterm birth, with looking at factors associated with the, um, with, uh, the interactions that we're looking at. Looking at in California, we're looking at in Michigan, the interactions between uh, preterm birth, race, genetic factors, and biologic markers. There are people at CDC that are working in authorization and appropriations, and I would be happy again to have them get back in touch with you, but as the scientific liaison for the branch that I work in, I, th that is information I'm just not familiar with. Okay. Uh, Dr. Spong, I, I don't have much time. You mentioned genomic research in the field of prematurity. Can you further expand about what we've learned about prematurity from genomic perspectives? There, there have been a number of smaller studies looking at specific genes or specific alterations in genes to try to identify why one group might be at higher risk of delivering preterm. And they've identified certain um, changes in alleles or, or, or um, um, changes in genes. However, we realize that really that's not going to answer the question, looking at small groups of people at one gene at a time or one, one alteration in a, in, a, in a gene at a time. Um, because of that, the NICHD undertook launching a network on genomics and proteomics of preterm birth to try to really do a genome-wide screen and really evaluate what are the changes in the genomics and proteomics associated with spontaneous preterm birth and indicated preterm birth. And that network is um, ongoing, and over the next couple of years, I expect we will, we will have some findings from it. Thank you. My time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Pitts. Um, I guess we're going to uh, the gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Castor. 
Thank you very much for your testimony. Dr. Callahan, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe there's no conclusive evidence that links uh, rising C-section rates to prematurity numbers or data that displays that increases in C-sections are the reason that prematurity rates went up uh, from 96 to 2007. However, the speculation is strong. Uh, the March of Dimes reported that from 1996 to 2006, C-sections accounted for 92 percent of all preterm births in the United States. Can you please discuss the type of studies that must be conducted to get to the bottom of this uh, and what steps are currently underway? Um, right. First of all, because I was a co-author on that paper, it was, it's really 92 percent of the increase in preterm births and not the total preterm birth rate. Um, still, that's a, a very compelling number. Um, the issue about this really hinges around the word cause. Preterm, during this time, 96 through, the, through now, in fact, pre, uh, cesarean section has been riding, rising for all, co for <clears throat> all comers in pregnancy, no matter what the gestational age. Perhaps more particularly in the late preterm births, but it's going up. I think that the issue around causes, and maybe we need to look at this a little bit differently, is not so much as it's cesarean section that's cause, but might we expand that a little bit more to say is it intervention? Because there's other ways for <clears throat> other decisions that are being made around delivery. Uh, and I think that's what we need to get at, what kinds of decisions are being made. There are always two steps in this process. The first step on a clinical basis is the physician and the patient together in the best, best circumstances make a decision that delivery should occur. So that's the first thing that happens, del should delivery occur. The next question is how delivery should occur. So I think that first step, should an intervention take place, is where we, what we really need to get at. One of the things that we're doing right now is we have a pilot study in three metropolitan Atlanta hospitals. We are going to abstract medical, we're going to identify th through vital records a group of uh, infants that were born between 34 and 36 weeks, go to the medical records and see if it is even possible by looking through the medical records to find a reason why the birth occurred. We're also planning on doing some key informant interviews in those hospitals, physicians, nursing staff, etc., to try to get some more qualitative information about what might be influencing those decisions. Because I think we really need to, what we really need to do is get at these processes. And this is hard stuff because this isn't just numbers, it's really getting around quality, qualitative information about what process goes on when decisions are made to deliver prior to term and then how delivery should be, take but, place. You know, the ACOG and the March of Dimes have uh, probably the best recommendations on protocols for mm -hmm. health providers. It sounds like you, um, the study in Atlanta, something along those lines, so you'd support something like that on a broader basis as well. I, mm -hmm. Yes? Thank you very much. Thank you. Gentleman from Texas, Mr. Burgess. Well, I'm actually glad that that subject that Ms. Castor brought up that you had, you're having that discussion. In 2006, when we reauthorized the National Institute of Health, there was report language in the bill dealing with the concept of doing a cesarean section study. Uh, Dr. Ken Lavino down at Parkland, where I trained, had been concerned that there was a movement toward elective cesarean section. I mean, within my professional lifetime, I saw rates go from 12 percent uh, during my residency to probably 25 percent when I concluded active practice in 2003, and now I suspect they're, they're even higher still. Dr. Lavino's concern was we may reach a point where simply the indication for cesarean section is patient demand. And we really ought to have the data before we reach that point because once we're there, it then becomes very hard to walk back from patient demand on, on something along those lines. So where are we with that? Are we, are, are we looking into the, uh, the concept of, of cesarean section rates and, and, and elective cesarean sections? Are 
the rates of late prematurity, which are rising a result of some iatrogenic influences, either with cesarean section or, or planned induction of labor. Uh, so, do you have do you have data on those on those issues? Yeah, that's. I mean, that's what we're exactly what we're trying to get at now with with these studies. There's also another study that I'm invo involved in peripherally th through my with wearing my CDC hat in Florida. That's look at, trying to look at that I I exact issue. There are no national data on cesarean section on demand. I think I was, it was Dr. Levino's concern that we ought to get that data before it becomes an established norm or we'll never be able to go back and, and randomly assign people to groups. Um, I mean, you know that. Right, it, it, exactly. it becomes almost an impossible, an impossible study to construct. So we ought to be prospective about our, about our look at that. And that would probably, to do that on a national basis, to include all deliveries in the United States, would, would likely demand uh, really changing our birth reporting forms to have that as a checkbox, if you will, or questions on that regarding the the, um, um, the indications for cesarean delivery to the to to the, to the degree that I, that could be done. I would be in wholehearted support. I don't know logistically if that's going to happen very quickly. Yeah, it's expensive to to, to do that type of study, but I, um, honestly, it may be something that we need to we need to look at in a prospective fashion. I represent a part of North Texas, the east side of Fort Worth. Um, Fort Worth is where the west begins, but I have the east side. That's where the east levels out. Um, we have some infant mortality rates in some of my zip codes that are, are some of the highest in the country. And if you look at African-American women and the, the infant mortality rates for African-American populations in those zip codes, it's, it, it's astoundingly high. And yet, on the other side of the Trinity River in Dallas, uh, their mortality rates are much more benign, and, and you don't see the racial disparities. Both counties are large. Both have significant urban populations. Both have a county hospital. Uh, the difference between the two is the availability and the access to what might be referred to as a community clinic or a federally qualified health center. And I've labored for the since 2005 when I began representing that part of Fort Worth to get a federally qualified health center there. We did not quite a year ago, so it'll be a while before we see if it makes a difference. But it really drove home to me that access may be a problem, and that, that's something we need to pay attention to. But Arguably, there's equal access in Dallas and Tarrant counties because of the availability of a county facility, even for someone who lacks the ability to pay. These are tax-supported institutions. But utilization was hugely different between Dallas and Tarrant County. And I think I attribute part of that to the fact that, that the, the availability, the, the doctors weren't where the people were. And that has been that has been one of the difficulties that, that I've sought to overcome. Do you guys have any experience with looking at things like that? Um, I don't have a lot of ex we don't have a lot of experience of looking at that particular thing. Although I th think you're probably referring to your home base, the the Parkland experience, and the report that they have that they have about reducing uh, preterm birth and infant mortality. And it is an intriguing model uh, where it's almost um, doing prenatal care, as I read that, almost as community outreach. And interestingly, back in the 50s, Dr. Pritchard, looking at a map of Dallas and putting a pin in the map of a very low-tech activity, but a, a pin in the map every time another hospital birth occurred, and that's where he set up a clinic after he got a cluster of, of pins. And we as residents would, would rotate through those clinics back in the 70s. Uh, so they have a, a long-standing, robust outpatient clinic department that is well accepted in the community because it's been there now for almost 50 years. Um, Again, on the other side of the Trinity, we don't have, we, we, that's not an established part of, of what people think about when they, they think of going to John Peter Smith. It's because it's a county hospital, not because there's a community clinic that feeds into that. Um, I just think there's, you know, we talk about how we spend money. We've got to spend money wisely. I just think that's one of the areas where, where we, we perhaps missed an opportunity in this health care bill that we did. Well, we missed a lot of opportunities, but an opportunity we missed in this health care law was, uh, was recognizing that. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You've been indulgent. I'll yield back the balance of my time. 
Thank you. The gentlewoman from the Virgin Islands, Ms. Christensen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to ask unanimous consent to insert uh, into the record a written testimony from Dr. Paula Braveman, Professor of Family and Community Medicine at the University of California at San Francisco. Without objection, so ordered. <laughs> what is Just it that you've given me um, again? Written, te written testimony um, that I'd like to insert into the record. Today, of today's hearing. Oh, okay. From uh, Dr. Paula Braveman. Braveman. Okay. You from Braveman. Uh, University of California, San Francisco. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. And just for the record, and I know this is not NIH, but it's really CDC. But I, I see no reason why the territories, infant mortality, low birth weight, and preterm deliveries are not um, reported on because we have that data. And I'm proud to say that our infant mortality in the Virgin Islands last reported was 7.56. And I can say I'm proud because I know where we came from to get to 7.56. And that's in a largely African-American and Puerto Rican community. Would the gentlelady yield for one second? I, I think it'd be good for the <laughs> for administration, because she's raised this a couple times, that they better be prepared to report on the territories when they come to this committee. We're glad to have her on the committee. <laughs> Thanks. I'll be happy to take thank that back to National Center for Health Statistics. Thank you. And um, thank you for raising the, both of you for raising the issue of the health, dis the disparities in African Americans that um, I didn't have to do my opening statement. Dr. Cal Callahan, um, what is puzzling and has been known for a while is that even in African-American women who are well-off, well-educated, live in uh, supportive surroundings, there's still a high, higher low birth weight baby. They still have higher uh, rates of low weight babies. Is there research being done to determine um, why this is? And are you coming up with, uh, this is sort of following up on the other question, but this is low birth weight babies, not preterm, necessarily, not necessarily infant mortality. For, I came to CDC in 2001, even prior to me coming there, there's been a long history of CDC bringing people together to look at this problem. Um, A lot of the work has been done in what, what is the social context of pregnancy in African American women? And what is the, con what is the effect of African American, what is the context of African American women in the United States and looking at the long-term effects of institutionalized discrimination and institutionalized race and how does that how does that chronic stress, which is very difficult to measure, there's not a blood test for it, but we know from some qualitative work that that stress exists, and we also know that, that chronic stress plays itself out biologically. There's no question about it. Stress is a biologic sure. phenomenon. We, there are pathways between what's going on in our brains, and our brains are connected to everything, that and there have been the hypothesis that some of these stress hormones actually regulate the what's called has been euphemistically called the placental clock, mm -hmm. and that it may be time there may be the messages coming down that it's time to be born that are not in the best interest of the woman or the baby, the baby, but that's what's going on. That being said. W when we start drawing these pathways, there are so many lines feeding back onto one another that they're not, almost not any lines anymore. They're this line going up, this line going down, and all of a sudden the line becomes a plane. Uh, the more important thing perhaps might be n not so much the recognition that stress plays a part, but then what in the next step, so what do we do about this? How can we ameliorate the effects of chronic stress. It's almost a bigger problem than trying to understand that stress affects our, our biology. Uh, we have but done. Are you actually, like, are you actually um, testing women in any way to see what their level of stress is? We're talking about people who are 
working in great jobs, have a decent education. And I'm, I, I mean, everybody yeah. has stress. Right, right. But are you, and I want to get one more question. Be, and, and in fact, when we look at at least epidemiologically, we see that women who, like in PRAMS, for example, they ask a lot of questions about individual stress, and individual stress is uh, much worse in when you sort of overlay their neighborhood context, for example. People who live in poor neighborhoods have a more profound response to stress, at least as it relates to preterm, sure. uh, than w women who don't. I think but, I would like also Dr. Spong to weigh in because NIH is doing a lot of that fundamental work as well. Okay, and, and, and before you answer though, let me just get my second question in, and to, which is to you, Dr. Sprong, and um, we're glad to hear about the August conference that you're having. Um, in your answer, could you also tell me if the trials with magnesium sulfate, progesterone, or treatment of bacterial vaginosis, if the, those trials are the um, people in those trials? Are they diverse enough to be able to tell the impact on an African American, a Latino, or a, um, American Indian? I thank you for both of your questions. The, I'm going to take the second question first. Um, the diversity of the patient populations in the network is required by the open recompetition every five years that the sites are geographically diverse and the population is geographically diverse. And I think one of the best examples is that progesterone was found to be equally beneficial in both African American women and non-African American women, which is so important given the disparity associated with it. So yes, we, we do strive for that and, and we are achieving that at least at this point. I would like to bring to your attention one study that the NICHD is currently has underway called the Community Child Health Research Network, which is focused specifically on the question you're asking about the African American community disparities in preterm birth, as well as infant mortality. And the goal of this network is to involve the community itself, along with the academic sites, to develop the interventions to try to see if we can understand the disparities, we're measuring these markers of stress, um, and 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 to try to see if we can identify potential interventions. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for your answers. And Mr. Chairman, thank you. I yield back the balance of the time I have left. I think that completes the question for uh, this panel. But thank you very much. It was helpful in terms of what we're trying to achieve, and we appreciate it. We may send you additional uh, questions from uh, some of the members within the next 10 days to answer in writing as well. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll ask the next panel to come forward. The three of you. First on my left is Dr. Alan R. Fleischman, who is Senior Vice President and Medical Director of the March of Dimes Foundation. And to, next to him is Dr. Charles S. Mahan, who is Dean and Professor Emeritus of the USF College of Public Health, the Lawton and Ray Childs Center for Healthy Mothers and Babies. Thank you for being here. And finally, Dr. Hal Lawrence, who is Vice President for Practice Activities of the American College of obstetricians and gynecologists. Thank you, Dr. Lawrence. And as you know, we have five minutes. Uh, we ask you each to speak for about five minutes. And then later, if you want to submit additional materials in writing, you can. And we'll start with Dr. Fleischman. Thank you, Chairman Fallon. Ranking Member Shimkus and members of the subcommittee, on behalf of the 3 million volunteers and 1,400 staff members of the March of Dimes, I want to thank the committee for your interest in the public health crisis of premature birth. As you know, the March of Dimes is a national voluntary health organization founded in 1938 by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt to prevent polio. Today, the foundation works to improve the health of mothers, infants, and children by preventing birth defects, premature birth, and infant mortality. Through research, community services, education, and advocacy. 
After three decades of continual increases in the rate of prematurity, the March of Dimes is heartened by the news that the rate of preterm birth has finally leveled off and has begun to decline. But now is not the time to rest on our laurels. The life-threatening and lifelong consequences of prematurity, as well as its extraordinary costs in dollars, can still be felt by more than half a million babies and their families, and each year in the United States, some 28,000 babies die before the first year of life due to preterm birth. Prematurity is also the number one cause of neonatal death and is the major contributor to infant mortality. It's responsible for lifelong disabilities. We've also learned that the complications of being born late preterm, just four to six weeks premature at 34 to 36 weeks gestation, are also significant. Since one third of brain growth and development occurs in the last five weeks of pregnancy. Infants born just four to six weeks early are more likely than term infants to have significant long-term deficits such as school learning problems, disabilities, and lower rates of college education and lower net incomes. In addition to the severe consequences, the costs of prematurity are immense. The Institute of Medicine estimated the annual societal economic costs associated with preterm birth are at least $26 billion a year. Approximately half or 48% of hospital stays for preterm infants are financed by Medicaid. In 2007, hospital costs for these babies averaged $45,900 each. In recent years, we've seen several effective interventions to decrease preterm birth through comprehensive quality improvement strategies. The Intermountain Health System in Utah initiated prospective review of all elective inductions and C-sections and were extremely successful with dramatic decreases in early deliveries. Parkland Hospital in Dallas, universal access to culturally sensitive, comprehensive perinatal services over the past 15 to 20 years, including high quality evidence-based care with accountability and continuous quality improvement, has resulted in the lowest rates of preterm birth among African Americans and indigent Hispanics in the United States. For the March of Dimes, the cesarean section question is simple. Every baby should be delivered at the right time for the right reason. We applaud the guidelines and efforts of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Adherence to their current guidelines and holding hospitals and clinicians accountable to these standards of care through quality and safety initiatives in hospitals can make a major difference in the rate of preterm birth and is needed in every hospital in the United States. So we're beginning to see some progress. But to sustain and to be truly successful in reducing the incidence of preterm birth and infant mortality, we require the continuing commitment of the federal government. That's why the March of Dimes is seeking reauthorization of the 2006 Premi Act to support expanded research, education, and demonstration projects. My written testimony provides more specific recommendations, but let me be clear. First, further research is essential into the fundamental causes of prematurity, and as the Institute of Medicine report and the Surgeon General's Conference re recommended, transdisciplinary research centers for prematurity funded by the National Institutes of Health with new dollars allocated for these activities will integrate a wide range of disciplines and study this complex problem. Second, we need to reauthorize and expand preterm activities at the CDC Division of Reproductive Health to improve national vital statistics and increase community-based intervention programs to impact on perinatal health disparities. And third, we need to reestablish the Federal Interagency Coordinating Council on Prematurity and Low Birth Weight to coordinate federal efforts and keep Congress apprised of progress on the issue of prematurity prevention. Finally, we hope that one of the outcomes of this hearing is that you will agree to work with us to draft and obtain swift enactment of legislation reauthorizing and expanding upon the progress made as a result of the Premi Act. And I am sure that each of you in the room join all of us at the March of Dimes who look forward to the day when every baby will be born healthy and stay healthy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Fleischman. Dr. Mahan. Um, Madam Chair and members of the committee, um, I finished my 
OBGYN residency 45 years ago and practiced for the first 20 years and then morphed into public health and uh, directed the state health department in Florida for eight years before becoming dean. And I've been asked to speak to two areas by the committee. One was disparities and um, the other is some public health steps that we could take immediately and in the fairly short term to start turning this around. Um, a lot of people have already spoken to the disparities. The biggest problems are in African Americans. Uh, in Florida, we have the most black births of any state in the union. And our black-white infant death ratio has gone from 1.9 to 1 to 2.6 to 1. And last year, we woke up in our Hillsborough County in Tampa and found that it was four times the white rate. Um, I've put some statistics there about maternal mortality, which, again, which black women suffer much more heavily than white women, and that's already been mentioned. Um, as far as the causes of infant mortality, there's a chart on my testimony that um, shows sort of a flow chart that shows how these things develop. And as Dr. Callahan pointed out, this is a very complex problem. Um, you have root causes of which health and health care are only two, and stress has been mentioned, economics, education, uh, family support, crime. All of these are things that can lead to a problematic outcome of pregnancy. Um, and the two biggest factors that enter into preterm birth are social issues and maternal health when the mother enters pregnancy. Um, it, by people smarter than I am, it's been predicted that um, if we corrected and every African-American woman got great health, got into great health and great health care um, without addressing those other issues, we may be able to nibble away at 30 percent of this problem. But other countries that have passed us in this area have dealt with the education, the jobs, and the other things that are important leading into this issue. Now, depending on where you live, this isn't just a problem of the black community. I'm on the board of the Frontier Nursing Service in Kentucky, and in Appalachia, which is mostly white, um, we have terrible pregnancy outcomes there also. We have different root causes. 25% uh, of our patients at the Frontier Nursing Service are addicted to prescription drugs. And uh, there's very little treatment available, and many providers will not accept people that are addicted into their practice. Um, the other issues that have been studied by Dr. Michael Liu at UCLA and Fleeta Mass Jackson in, at, uh, in Atlanta, Morehouse, are that black women are victims of what's called weathering, and that is that if you're a black mother that has a low birth weight baby, your low birth weight daughter is more likely to also produce a low birth weight baby. And then they predict it may take three or four generations of being upper income to actually shed uh, this weathering system, um, which they think is mostly due to stress. And adding to that, black women have the highest rates of cesarean of any group in the country. Now, the second part I was asked is, what public health interventions could we do to reduce prematurity? Uh, well, one thing you could do right now is pick up the phone, call CMS, and tell Medicaid to stop paying for elective inductions and cesareans um, at any stage of pregnancy. And I don't even agree with ACOG's recommendation of 39 weeks, and, and we agree that that may be arbitrary. but. There's probably no reason a normal woman should ever be induced, no matter where she is. The second thing is that in our studies in Florida, uh, we find that women that are agreeing to this, and national studies show that generally when elective things are done, the doctor recommends that the patient generally does not bring up the subject. In fact, national studies show that less than one half of one percent of patients do, but they 
they're quick to go along with what the doctor recommends. Um, so we have some, we've designed some informed consent that's true informed consent, showing that elective procedures such as elective cesarean uh, are hazardous to the health of the mother and the baby. Uh, they are not equivalent to having a vaginal birth. And again, these are in low-risk women. Um, and those are part of the attachments you will get. Unfortunately, you don't have them right now. Um, vaginal birth after cesarean has essentially disappeared, even though studies show that having a repeat cesarean is slightly more dangerous to the mother and the baby than having a vaginal birth. So I would propose a, a new scale of payment for Medicaid that would be something like $2,000 for a vaginal birth, $2,000 I mean, $2, for a VBAC, $1,500 for a vaginal birth, and $1,000 for a C-section, which takes less time and effort. Those are immediate steps that could be taken. In the short term, I'd say in about a year, we, we could encourage the development of new pregnancy provider models. Most other countries have a midwife and doula-based system for primary care for normal women in pregnancy. That can even be used for people that have high-risk problems co-managed with an obstetrician. Although I would recommend, and this is just coming from me, that we stop producing generalist OBGYNs because, as ACOG has pointed out, the young folks coming out today don't want to work on nights and weekends. And turn it over to midwives, backed up by an increased number of maternal fetal medicine specialists working with groups of midwives, which is a model that I have worked in in Gainesville over the years. It's a wonderful lifestyle way to work. I also put in here, pay midwives the same amount to obstetrician, as obstetricians get paid for taking care of normal people, but it was pointed out to me today that that's already in the new health care bill. So forget that one. Um, I would encourage the movement to group prenatal care that both ACOG and other groups have recommended instead of individual prenatal care, especially for low-income women, so that they can do some uh, community support of each other. Dr. McGann, um, can you um, bring it to close and we'll move on? Pardon? Can you bring it to a uh, yes, sum I, I up? Will. And, and um, I think develop quality standards, provide preconception, interconception care, and then I have an extensive section on the cost savings that this could have, which would be in the tune of about $50 billion. Thank you very much. Dr. Lawrence. Thank you, Representative Castor. And I'm sorry, there it's on. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Castor and Chairman Pallone and the distinguished members of this subcommittee. My name is Dr. Hal Lawrence, and I'm an obstetrician gynecologist and ACOG's Vice President of Practice Activities. I'm here today representing 53,000 physicians and partners in women's health care. Preterm birth is one of the most complicated and difficult issues in obstetrics. As a nation, we still don't know very much about the risk factors, the causes, or prevention of preterm labor. We do know that preterm labor is the most common cause of hospitalization before birth that there is a link between preterm birth and infant mortality, that the rate of preterm births is a growing public health problem that cuts across social, racial, ethnic, and economic groups, and that our nation must do better. ACOG firmly believes that we can make a difference and we're committed to leading the change, and we are very clear that deliveries before 39 weeks gest gestation should only occur when an accepted medical, maternal, or fetal indication for delivery exists. We have been intimately involved in a number of efforts over the years to improve research and practice guidelines to reduce the rate of premature births in, the, in America. ACOG is the nationally recognized source for clinical guidelines and medical information that help shape maternity care based on evidence-based, peer-reviewed science and some expert opinion. These include practical information on late preterm births, management of preterm labor, assessment of risk factors for preterm birth, use of progesterone to reduce preterm birth, and obesity and pregnancy. But where research has not been conducted, clinical guidelines have to wait. Preterm birth can only occur, preterm birth can occur in any pregnancy, 
and our current clinical tools cannot determine a woman's risk, except for women, as you've already heard, who have had previous preterm births, the only clear risk factor. Even so, the ability to predict whether a woman is at risk of preterm delivery value only if an intervention is available to reduce or eliminate that risk. And right now, we have very few effective interventions. Better research can be translated into more complete clinical guidelines and better care. ACOG has been intricately involved in a number of other efforts to advance our knowledge in this area, including the 2006 Institute of, Institute of Medicine report on preterm birth, the Surgeon General's 2008 conference on the prevention of preterm birth, and the 2009 Symposium of, on Quality Improvement to Prevent Prematurity that we did with the March of Dimes. These efforts identified gaps in clinical knowledge and research, many of which ACOG and our MOMS initiative, and that stands for Making Obstetrics and Maternity Safer, calls on Congress to support, and those include NIH research to reduce preterm births and to focus on obesity, CDC surveillance and research to assist state maternal mortality reviews, modernize state birth and death record systems, and improve the safe motherhood program. The HRSA Fetal and Infant Mortality Review, which brings together local OBGYNs and health departments to reduce infant mortality rates and improve the Maternal Child Health Block Grant. Comparative effectiveness research into preterm birth interventions and efficacy. Disparities research. Testing the obstetric medical home to address the unique issues of pregnancy and supporting quality improvement measures. It's impossible not to also mention the link, but link between medical liability and the, the, and the practice of obstetrics performing deliveries. In the world of childbirth, a perfect pregnancy can turn disastrous in a heartbeat, and through no fault or malpractice of the obstetrician gynecologist. Vaginal births after cesarean sections, VBACs, can seem perfectly normal until something goes wrong. At that moment, one, and sometimes two lives, can be on the line and seconds count. It's often in these scenarios that OBGYNs get sued and re result in very large awards regardless of the physician's care. The risk is really that great. ACOG recommends exploring medical liability alternatives, including early offer programs, healthcare courts, alternative dispute resolution, and birth injury compensation funds. And I'd like to thank Representative Pitts and Gringry for your attention to this important issue in your earlier comments. I would also like to thank Representative Burgess, who plans to introduce a bipartisan piece of legislation extremely relevant to today's hearing. His legislation will provide for research on birth defects and breastfeeding to help educate women on ways to reduce the risk to their babies and have healthy pregnancies. Once introduced, I urge the subcommittee to, to quickly take up this legislation. I'd also like to uh, thank uh, Chairman Pallone. ACOG has been uh, fortunate to be able to work with his staff and thank him for his focus on stillbirth and, and sudden infant death, and we look forward to uh, <coughs> offering support as that legislation goes forward. I, again, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to provide this statement. A written statement of my comments has been supplied, and we applaud your commitment and leadership on this issue. We look forward to working closely with you and the subcommittee. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Your testimony was outstanding. Uh, let me start by, by asking about a subject that you each very briefly touched on, and that's the um, inaccurate gestational dating. Um, it seems like uh, there is a concern out there about, okay, if the recommendation is you go fully to term at 39, 40 weeks, how do you really, how do you really measure, especially in certain uh, certain subgroups that you have an accurate accurate due date. What and then how do we? Is it the same be, based on socioeconomic factors and education, or is there something a little more concrete that we can that we can get? I'd like to hear from all of you on that, Doctor. Doctor, me, sir. That well, thank you for that question. Now, obviously. Whenever you have any recommendations on timing of delivery, having accurate dates of, of that pregnancy is crucial. And we have public gui published guidelines on how you determine when somebody is at least 39 weeks gestation. And those guidelines clearly state that you have to have had an ultrasound 
at least in the early second trimester, to confirm a estimated date of confinement or due date, uh, so you're sure they're at 39 weeks. Or you've had to have had 36 weeks of pregnancy following a serum or urine pregnancy test. Or you have had to be able to have documented fetal heart tones for 30 weeks uh, along since, since the first time they were documented. All three of those methodologies will confirm that somebody is at least at 39 weeks gestation. I know that there's discussion about earlier first trimester scanning. We think that that's an a interesting opportunity also. The reason we have discussed this several times, and Dr. Fleshman and I have discussed this several times, um, you know, and I know in Great Britain they do something called a booking scan. Um, but when our committees look at this and carefully weigh the benefit and the costs of those ultrasounds, at that, six, that 16, 18, 19 week gestation, not only do you get a very accurate gestational age calibration, plus or minus seven to nine days, you also get a good anatomy evaluation of that fetus. So there's a whole lot more benefit found. And so because of that, we've been unable, our committees have been unable to say we should recommend two scans at, at this point in time. It, we, we had talked about this before um, we testified, but the um, 39 weeks that ACOG recommends, I, I think we should look at that again in the college because if a woman's entirely normal, um, why should you even have the 39-week recommendation? Um, you know, Mother Nature tells you when term is because labor starts. And the Institute for Healthcare um, Improvement uh, basically recommends that we wait for labor to begin and uh, see how labor goes, uh, again, in normal people. You certainly have to... Uh, count on all the things Dr. Lawrence said for somebody who's high risk if you're going to have to deliver them early. We go back to the Institute of Medicine report in 2006 that clearly recommended early ultrasounds in the first trimester as the most accurate uh, gestational dating, which would, I think, give us combined with history a, uh, a very important um, public health program in order to assure that the kinds of complex things that Dr. Lawrence uh, is saying are the appropriate ways if you don't have the earliest ultrasounds. Um, I think if we did that, as uh, um, almost every obstetrician in America has in their office the ultrasound machine at the earliest times to find the um, fetal viability and as well as the uh, a fetal gestational age, uh, we would be making better decisions at the end of pregnancy. Uh, we know time and time again from intervention um, studies that if you put off at least till 39 weeks, and I'm not disagreeing with Dr. Mahan, uh, but at least till 39 weeks, you run a very low risk of prematurity. And if you don't have accurate gestational dating, you increase the risk of premature birth. Okay, Mr. Shimkus. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I concur with you. Um, it's great, great testimony. And one thing I really um, enjoy about the the subcommittee is it's in, the, in healthcare. It's a caring profession. I mean, everybody's doing it for the right reason. To whether it's adult and this one, of course, on on the unborn children and getting it. So it's it's it's. With all our fights and battles, it's 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 really great to have people who are trying to are very concerned. Dr. Mahan, I really enjoyed. I have questions for you, but I um, I'm an old Army infantry guy, and it's this uh, you know we're just keep it simple, and it seems like your testimony kind of keeps it simple. Uh, God's created a phenomenal human beings. Not your words, mine. Uh, the body tells us when. We shouldn't be doing things that are unnatural unless we have to. Uh, I think if I could summarize, and then there's ways to incentive that, incentivize that financially because we are a big payer. We're a third payer in a lot of the health care delivery system. And so why not use that tool? We, we did miss that opportunity, but then maybe there's other opportunities to, to relook at that. I, I think it was, uh, I, I, I really enjoyed the testimony. Uh, uh, Dr. Fleischman, um, 
you, you state uh, that there are several factors that have caused increase in elective inductions. It's kind of leading on to this debate and cesarean deliveries. We do mention in your statement about the litigious environment and defensive medicine. Can you talk about that? I'm from Illinois. We've had a huge medical liability crisis. We had a, a Supreme Court campaign turn on this. Uh, and um, even though that was the primary reason because all our, uh, our physicians were leaving the state, uh, it wasn't enough and that we've gone back to that. So I know we don't like to talk about it, but you, it's in your statement. Talk about that for me, will you? Well, we're very sympathetic to the obstetric practitioners concerning their concerns and fears about the litigious environment. We believe the best way to prevent lawsuits is to have the highest quality care, to set standards, to set guidelines, and to practice appropriately with appropriate accountability. That protects both the patient and the doctor. And I think we're moving in those directions. We have the National Quality Forum and the Joint Commission and others setting standards. We have CMS willing now to set standards around perinatal health in quality measures. We think that high quality practice is the way for the obstetric community to assure that they're actually uh, yeah. able to protect themselves and their patients. And I appreciate that. But how do you tie that into the litigious? I, I get it. I mean, if we don't have problems, then you don't have lawsuits. But how do you tie that into the the courtroom drama that, that unfolds, uh, is it making sure, uh, I've been through this for years now as far as a public policy guy, is it make sure that people say, I'm sorry, I mean, what, how do you tie that to the courtroom? That's the issue. Well, I, I think mean, your words, I mean, I'm not right. putting, right. you talked about the litigious environment and defensive medicine. Right. Well, we can stand up tall if we practice high quality medicine based on ACOG guidelines and appropriate care. And if we do that, then even if we make, make our way to the courtroom, we can have a reasonable defense of good, high-quality practice and decrease the incentives on the part of those who are bringing those lawsuits because they'll be unsuccessful. But, but you're, not willing, to talk, you're, not talking, you're not willing to talk about the courtroom dilemma that they still face regardless of this. Uh, Dr. Lawrence, you want to weigh in on... Yeah, thank you very medical much. Medical liability yeah. and yeah, medical liability is is just a huge issue in a, in our practice, and I, and I think y'all have heard this, I'm sure, before, but you know, over 90 percent of practicing obstetrician gynecologists have been sued, and I would tell you, 90 percent of anybody isn't doing bad things, and I think each of you know that. Uh, I always usually say in any organization, you may have 10 percent or, or bad actors. Unfortunately, we find that here. I found that in the military. You find that in schools. I would agree, 90 percent. But not 90 percent. I, I would have to agree, 90 percent. There's and, something else going on. And, you know, and, and, the, and the thrust of your question, you know, ACOG works hard to put forth guidelines and, and enabling medical staffs and local community hospitals to put to create practice parameters and protocols to help take care of these patients. The problem for us is that even when you do all that, even when you do it all right, you're, that does not guarantee a perfect outcome. Reproduction has never been perfect. Sadly, reproduction will never be perfect. There will always be adverse events. There will always be situations that, that are not predictable. And somehow in this process, if the providers are doing everything right, we should not be held accountable for an adverse outcome that we could not have prevented. And, you know, and that's, that's true in the VBAC situation that I, that, that I mentioned. It's true in many other situations in, in managing patients, whether they're high-risk patients or whether they're deemed to be low-risk, and then all of a sudden there's a cord prolapse or all of a sudden there's an abruption, or all of a sudden there's a vasa previa. I've been there. I've, I've jumped in and done those deliveries. And fortunately, they usually go okay, but not always. But if you do it right, somehow the liability system has to recognize that and, and deal with this other than within a tort arena. Madam Chair, I'm not going to follow up with a question, but if I may, um, just again thank you all. Um, and I'm going to follow up with a written question on Medicaid expansion and reimbursement rates and other things that I'd like to get into, but uh, time is not going to allow me to do that. Good. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Dr. Christensen. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Mahan, um, true informed consent. How do you how do you um, define that, and how do you arrive at that? I think uh, it needs to be based on, um, and I've worked with the National Coalition to Improve Maternity Services on this for the past year, especially for informed consent for cesarean, mm -hmm. and um, we based all of our efforts on science, uh, evidence base. And, um, but what we were finding, and this is among studies of upper income people, upper middle class people, was that um, it was really a last minute sort of glossed over thing that this is all going to be okay. Mm -hmm. So in the attachments that you'll get, okay. um, the, uh, is a copy of the, um, let me see if I can, of the, it's called a, the risks of cesarean section, a checklist that women should be given at about 32 weeks of pregnancy, not a term, so that she and her partner can go through it, yeah. look at the both differences. Both sign? Pardon? Are both supposed to sign it? Uh, I believe so, yes. Yeah. And so is the care provider. Um, now, this is just a suggestion. It's not been adopted except by this particular group. But for instance, when the mother looks at the section possible problems for my baby. Um, my baby's more likely to have breathing difficulties. My, this mm -hmm. is after mm -hmm. cesarean. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's normally best for labor to begin uh, if I need a schedule, so on, so on, so on. And uh, my baby's more likely to die than if it was born vaginally, which is not a high chance, but, but um, so it is statistically more likely to do that. The mother needs to know that. Thank you. And um, this is the, the, your third immediate recommendation. I would ask Dr. I would ask you and Dr. Lawrence, but perhaps Dr. Fleischman as well. Um, what is the data on outcomes in vaginal birth after cesarean, which is also, and does ACOG recommend um, that after the first cesarean that women go through a vaginal um, delivery? ACOG, in fact, we just, you know, following the NIH consensus conference that we uh, just participated in, have a new uh, practice bulletin about discussing uh, vaginal birth after cesarean section. And in there, we do recommend that women be offered a trial of labor uh, after cesarean section, assuming that that section was for a non recurring cause, assuming that there wasn't, you know, like she had. So it was had a breach, a, and it, this one correct, is. Correct, like a, a breach or, or, or a feel. Into, and we do recommend that those, that those patients be counseled and offered that procedure. Institutions have to be able to provide the services to support that procedure. And here's the, the problem the problem with, with VBAC is where the risk of a uterine rupture in spontaneous labor mm -hmm. is low. It's low. less than 1%. Less than 1%, okay. If, however, it occurs, the same Dr. Liu that Dr. Mahan just used as a reference earlier has a study from Los Angeles County that shows you have 12 minutes to get that baby born, or that baby will probably not survive, and if it does survive, will be severely handicapped. So because of liability concerns, many institutions and many providers have said, I'm not willing to put that baby at that much risk. At that same NIH consensus conference on VBAC, one of the attendings from Parkland stood up and gave a scenario of a perfectly managed VBAC. Everything was doing fine. In fact, this patient had delivered vaginally after her previous cesarean section, which puts her in a lower risk. Everything was going great. Uterus ruptured, crashed cesarean section, baby delivered, baby did not do well, $11.5 million settlement against the institution and the physicians. And that group no longer does VBACs. So, I mean, that's, that's the scenario that vaginal birth after cesarean section has placed many obstetrical providers, and that's the reason that the concern has been raised about that procedure. And I'd follow up with that, and I agree. Um, 
and I think that was an excellent conference. But the issue that we have to deal with now is that, um, you know, I think Dr. Spong's studies that she's helped publish have shown that um, VBAC is slightly safer for the mother and baby overall than a repeat cesarean. You can lose babies and mothers with a repeat cesarean. The problem that we need to deal with, and it is tied up with the liability issue, is that since so few hospitals are providing VBAC, and at USF we do do that in our practice group, um, women in communities that can't get it are turning to, turning to home birth uh, to because they can't get it anywhere else. And they had such a bad experience with their first pregnancy that they don't want to go back to the hospital. And we're really worried about that too. So it's another reason to deal with the liability crisis. If my, cha if my chairman would let the third. May I? Yeah. I think the fundamental question, and I agree with these gentlemen, but the fundamental question is how do we decrease primary cesarean sections yeah. that are done unnecessarily? Yeah. And we know that if we induce a woman when she's not ready to deliver, she's highly likely to result in a cesarean section. And <clears throat> then we put the woman in the position of, you know, the question of vaginal birth after cesarean. I think that's the real challenge. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Dr. Fleischman, you mentioned the uh, Institute of Medicine. Uh, the Institute of Medicine recently published a 570-page uh, resource book entitled Preterm Birth, Causes, Consequences, and, and Prevention. On pages 517 and 518, abortion is noted as an, quote, immutable, in quote, risk factor. However, the risk factor is avoidable if women are given risk information prior to pregnancy. My question is to, I'd like each of you to respond to this, and I, I know of 59 studies that have found that women with prior induced abortions are at increased risk for premature birth and low birth rate. Question is two part. Do your organizations acknowledge abortion as a risk factor first? And is it included in your information services? Are you aware of efforts to inform women about such a rich fa risk factor? Uh, each of you, please. Dr. Fleischman. Right. At the March of Dimes, we continually monitor those data that you've uh, um, <clears throat> mentioned. And the most recent data uh, from modern techniques in termination do not give convincing evidence of that as a significant risk factor for preterm birth. And we do not raise that issue within our materials. Dr. Mann? I don't know the answer to that. I know that um, one of my, I just read the executive summary of that report. One of my problems with it was that it was a little behind the times because it really wasn't dealing with the elective uh, induction cesarean issue. But one of the things I bring out in my testimony that I hope you will read is that one of the key things to um, improve maternal health and infant health in the U.S. is interconception care and preconception care so that uh, especially interconception care of women that have already had a low birth weight baby, right now essentially we just drop them and we wait to see when they're going to have the next pregnancy when we know that it would be best if we help them space their pregnancy for at least two years. And so I think following the diabetic woman who just had a pregnancy, making sure she's in good shape, following the woman who had a low birth weight baby, trying to get her out there for two years before she gets pregnant again, if we can provide, you know, in Florida, we woke up last year and the CDC told us that we're 51st of all the states plus DC in providing reversible contraception to women. And this is the 50th anniversary of the pill. When the pill came out and I was a student in Chicago, the average family size was six and a half. And now it's one and a half. If we want to reduce abortion, if it does cause this problem, we've got to stop putting our heads in the sand about helping people space their pregnancies. Dr. Lawrence? Well, I'd like to have a couple points. Uh, first off, I am aware of the APLOG data. Uh, we do review that data. 
And I also agree with Dr. Fleshman that, that more recent studies with more recent technologies don't show a real correlation between induced pregnancy termination and premature birth. I also think that Dr. Mahan is, is, is right on target here. And I think one of the benefits of the health care reform uh, bill law is that now patients are going to be able to have ongoing continual care. And as Dr. Spong said earlier, the best way to have a healthy baby is to have a healthy mommy. And ongoing well women's health care rolled in with contraceptive care, rolled in with preconception care, is, the, is a major factor in helping to reduce preterm birth and improve uh, maternal and infant outcome. Thank so you. I think we have an opportunity. Thank you. Dr. Fleischman, I didn't quite get your response. Do you believe comprehensive medical malpractice reform would potentially help providers stop practicing defensive medicine? Well, I guess the, the detail of what the comprehensive medical malpractice reform means Well, like they have in California the, or Texas. Well, uh, we have not taken a position on that at the March of Dimes. Okay. What about you, Dr. Mahan? Absolutely. All right, Dr. Lawrence. I am in total support. If we get comprehensive medical liability reform, it will help not only OBGYN but all areas of medicine. Uh, uh, Dr. Mahan, you. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm out I'd of time. I'd like to get Dr. Yeah, Burgess thank in you. before we can adjourn. Uh, uh, my time's up. Dr. Burgess. Yeah, we've got a series of crucial votes, and the entire nation hangs in the balance <laughs> in 15 minutes. So we, we will have to take off and do those. I appreciate you all being here today. I appreciate you staying with us, um, listening to your testimony and your, your answer to some of the other questions is certainly intriguing. Uh, Dr. Fleischman, I'm going to answer Mr. Pitts's last question for you. Defensive medicine is learned behavior and physicians of the generation of Dr. Mann and Dr. Lawrence and myself are probably not likely to unlearn that behavior overnight. There may be a, uh, uh, certainly it will help, but uh, when I'm criticized by the president because we did liability reform in Texas and McAllen, Texas is still a high cost place to get health care, you're not gonna change it overnight, even, even as good as our law has been in Texas. Um, I don't think there's any question, you know, Dr. Mayne, you talk about, about VBACs, and I remember the studies that came out of Los Angeles while I was still in practice, and, and I think they just absolutely threw up their hands and stopped offering VBACs for a while because of the liability issue, and certainly, Dr. Lawrence, your story of, of what the, uh, the group in Dallas got into with the $11 million settlement, if we're paying a thousand dollars more for a VBAC, but we get hit with an eleven million dollar judgment. That's eleven thousand VBACs we're going to have to do to cover the cost of that eleven million dollar judgment. And it's just as you as you guys know, I mean the numbers just don't work out. We do have to we do have to undertake a more sensible medical justice system in this country. I don't know what it is. I like early offer, but what's happening in Texas now with a trifurcated cap on on non-economic damages seems to be working, and it seems to be working in a in a big way, and not just holding down costs of of premiums for for practicing physicians, but holding down costs for institutions that self-insure for liability, allowing smaller uh, not-for-profit hospitals to have more money to invest in capital improvements, nurses' salaries, and the very things we want our smaller nonprofit hospitals to do in our communities. So I, I certainly stand behind what's happened in Texas. I would like to see, I would have liked to have seen us done, do more in the health care law that passed, but unfortunately we, we didn't do it. Now, Dr. Mann, your discussion of of, on, on Medicaid, you say for Medicaid to stop paying for elective inductions and elective cesarean sections in any stage of pregnancy. That may be great in theory, but we have a problem back home where you can have a hard time finding a doctor who'll take a patient's Medicaid because the reimbursement rates are so much lower than commercial insurance and uh, as a consequence, are, are we likely to make it even tougher for that woman to get prenatal care because we've now created a, 
a more hostile environment within the Medicaid system that the practicing physician is going to look at it and say, well, I'm, you know, maybe I was about to get over the funding problem, but I'm darn sure not going there when they're telling me how to practice. Well, I thought that too, but uh, we're working on the issue in Florida now because we did study it and find an association between the rising rates and of cesarean and the rising rates of late preterm, and that will be published pretty soon. And we found that the, our colleagues in obstetrics around the state, and they found this already ahead of us in North Carolina and Ohio, that uh, uh, they understand that this is producing bad outcomes in both women and babies uh, that otherwise would have been normal, but that they should not be delivered by cesarean or induced if they're normal people because the outcomes are worse. And I think we're finding that most of the OBs, as we approach them on this and saying, um, we're producing a lot of bad babies because of this, are extremely willing to uh, listen to that and to change their practice. Well, if, I would and, say- And I agree, that, I agree that from state to state, the um, Medicaid rates are a problem. And, uh, but you know, half of our births are Medicaid and these are doctors taking care of them, and they seem to be willing to uh, step in and reverse this thing. Now, in the health care law that just passed, there was some protection for primary care that Medicaid rates would be 75% of, of Medicare rates. But in your state, are OBGYNs considered primary care? I don't think so. I don't think so either. And of course, in the law, we don't know because that's all up to the Secretary of Health yeah. and Human Services, and we're not having the types of hearings that would allow us to get an idea of what their thinking is over there. So we're just all going to be surprised one day. But Thank even you. then, even then, if there's a funding cliff that occurs in two years' time, and even if we were to get OBGYNs as designated as primary care, so that they would get 75% of the Medicaid, Medicare rates. Uh, that funding cliff kicks in in two years' time when we're back to the, to the pre-existing Medicaid. So all of this becomes terribly difficult and terribly complicated. Um, I guess just one last observation. Dr. Lawrence, you, you, you referenced the medical home. Um, that's what the generalist ob Gin, at least when I was practicing, that's what we were. And Dr. Mann says we shouldn't have those anymore. The generalists are... Are, are not helpful. Let's go to midwives and, and perinatologists. But you seem to see value in the medical home model, and I would just submit to you, to physicians of my generation were trained, that's, that's what we were trained to do. And I think we still train OBGYNs to do that. We are the care coordinators for well women's health care, essentially from the late teenage years up until early to mid, after years after menopause. And we definitely are the care coordinators and providers for obstetrical patients. And we're the ones who are able to intervene when those acute crises occur. Thank you, doctor, very much. <laughs> We're going to have to bring the hearing to a close. But I would like to ask uh, Dr. Fleischman to, to help bring us to a close and spend one minute on uh, the implications for brain development, because you have a terrific um, visual uh, exhibit here that I'm, I'm afraid they won't be able to see at home, but if you could describe the difference uh, in brain development in a, in a, um, in 30, from 35 weeks to 39 to 40 weeks to close us uh, out for the hearing. I'd appreciate it. We, d we developed this visual for a project in Kentucky to help women understand that one-third of the growth and development of the brain occurs between 35 and 39 or 40 weeks, that all those neurons, all those nerve cells that interact with each other are continually growing in those last five weeks, and that that growth and development is critically important to the fetus. It can happen outside the uterus, but it happens better inside a uterus if the fetus is not in any jeopardy. And that has been very helpful, both to help clinicians understand what they can say to women, and it helps women to not push hard for inappropriate early deliveries. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you all have been outstanding. All of the witnesses were just terrific today. That concludes all the questioning. In closing, I want to remind members that you may submit additional questions for the record to be answered by the relevant witnesses 
The question should be submitted to the committee clerk within the next 10 days. The clerk will notify your offices of the procedures. Without objection, this meeting of the subcommittee is adjourned. And we will save a grateful nation. This week on America and the Courts, Supreme Court nominee Elena Kagan moderates a discussion on the recent Supreme Court term at the Sixth Circuit Judicial Conference. Panelists include University of California Irvine Law School Dean Irwin Chermer.